to welcome the audience at this exceptional event uh, in the outstanding obstacles of COVID-19. Uh, and this webinar has been planned under the umbrella of WPA 10th Zone, which is Eastern Europe with the principal role of Russian Society of Psychiatrists. Uh, at the same time, in my first introductory words, I'd like to stress a key role of Professor Kostas Fontulakis, the chair of the WPA section on pharmacopsychiatry and evidence-based psychiatry in the organization of this webinar. Thank you, Kostas. Uh, and I'm lucky to begin and uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to provide the electronic stage for the president-elect of the World Psychiatric Association, Professor Abzal Javed. Um, you know that the sharpness of his mind and the ability to predict the future in strategic direction of psychiatry development could create principal frame for, for our seminar webinar today. Please, Abzal, take, take over. Well, thank you very much, Oleg. Uh, let me once again thank you, uh, Professor Kostos, Peter Morozov, all the organizers, Daria and the society uh, and the member society from Russia for taking up this important challenge. As I was mentioning earlier, this is a unique opportunity for WPA to have such a webinar that is organized and that has got the privilege of participation from WPA sections from WPA member societies and WPA zone. And just looking at the list uh, in the Zoom group chat, this is indeed a matter of great pleasure that this meeting is attended by a number of professional colleagues from Europe, Eastern Europe and Asia. I think this actually gives WPA a unique challenge, but at the same time, an opportunity to think, how can we really link these countries in this way? And while we are talking about COVID-19, again, although it is a disaster, but it has really given us a number of opportunities to review and to revive our approaches to understand mental ill disorders, how to implement new and innovative changes, and especially our section on evidence-based psychiatry is actively involved in looking at different options that we can offer to the world. And one thing which is very important, and I hope that all the organizers will keep this in mind, that almost 70 to 80% of world's population live in low and middle income countries. So when WPA is using its platform, we have to be mindful that we should really try to translate the evidence, the guidelines, and the current practices for the use of a vast majority of our professionals who are deprived of resources and who have got a lot many difficulties. So with these words, I, on my personal behalf and on behalf of World Psychiatric Association, congratulate the organizers and hope Professor Kostos and his team will continue offering such educational and academic services for our WPA membership. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Oleg. Thank you very much, Ozal. Uh, and as the organizing committee member, let me introduce my respected colleague, Professor Peter Morozov from Moscow, a vice president on international affairs of Russian Society of Psychiatrists. He is holding the position of WPA standing committee on planning and his outstanding talent to organize successful scientific meetings is widely known in Eastern Europe, European countries and decently abroad. I expect his non-formal position today in the moderation of the webinar. Professor Morozov? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alec. Well, I try to be very brief and informal because 
for me it is uh, really a very important event for for many reasons i was great enthusiast of organization of education in different way for different people in the different regions and now we have a new experience so it was because of covid uh, 19 uh, we cancelled two great meetings in this year in russia one uh, regional congress of the um, World Psychiatric Association and one Congress of the Union for Mental Health. And in the framework of this uh, Congress of Union for Mental Health, we normally organize uh, so-called uh, SUSDL courses for the young psychiatrists. And we invite really top level people coming to Moscow normally. It was uh, president and vice president of different uh, uh, organizations, psychiatric organizations. And they always provide us uh, uh, really unique lectures and now this year it looks like we miss it so it was a fantastic compensation such initiative uh, provided by world psychiatric association and in particularly uh, chief of the section of the evidence-based psychiatry professor Pontulakis, who is uh, really real engine of this uh, of this initiative we are very grateful on behalf of the Russian Psychiatric Society, our president, Professor Nezimov, I would like to express my deep gratitude to WPA, to Professor Pantulakis, and to all, to all uh, who really organized this meeting. And of course, to you, Ole Kasa, chief of the, this Zone 10, WPA Zone 10, and of course, uh, to Daria, who make a lot of uh, uh, practical technical work to, organize, to coordinate all our efforts. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Morozov. And in order to create some logical order in presenting organizing committee members, let me introduce a person well known for each participant of this webinar, Daria Smirnova. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry in Samara State Medical University in Russia. As well, she is uh, on the position of research fellow at the Center for Clinical Research in Neuropsychiatry of the University of Western Australia. It is interesting to know that Daria's growing as a scientist was under Professor Morozov's supervision, so this is an example of some kind of continuity of young researcher preparation in the field of psychiatry that is a trait of modern time. Uh, please, Daria, uh, maybe you can say oh. a few words. Dear Alex, thank you very much for this kind introduction and thank you very much to this. Uh, it's my honor to be connected to Professor Peter Morozov and to continue a bit a big job he's, he really is doing for Russia and for World Psychiatric Association. First of all, I would like also to express my sincere gratitude uh, to this valuable support of World Psychiatric Association, um, Eastern European uh, Zone 10, uh, the sections which are guided by uh, Professor Kostas Fontulakis and uh, uh, Russian Society of Psychiatry and the International uh, Society of Neurobiology and Psychopharmacology supervised by Professor Kostas Fontulakis as well. I would also like to um, express our sense of gratitude on behalf of uh, organizing committee and participants uh, to our outstanding speakers who really found their precious time to spend with us on Saturday summer evening or afternoon in different countries, you know, and to share their knowledge with us in such a hard time. I would also like to greet all the participants of the meeting from many different countries, as, as, as we already discussed, not, from, not just from Eastern Europe, but also from Southeast Asia, uh, who were highly inspired and motivated to join us and to be with us today. Also, among us, there are members of World Psychiatric Association Early Career Psychiatrist Committee, and we are welcome them as well. And also among us, uh, there are um, valuable study group members of our big international project, which is guided by Professor Kostas Pontulakis, which is titled Estimating the Effect of COVID-19 Outbreak 
on mental health of general population. And I would like to say that this kind of meeting is really a big opportunity for us to reduce this social distance between us, which is good for our own mental health today. And uh, uh, finally, some technical remarks I would like to uh, mention. The first one that uh, as we discussed with the organizing committee, all the microphones of the participants will be muted during lectures uh, to preserve the sound uh, and the quality of the sound of the lectures and to avoid additional noise. As you know, it's usually done like this. And the second point is related to question and uh, answers um, sessions, which I will be uh, we'll try to moderate. Uh, so uh, I will ask participants, I will ask participants to write down the questions to the lecturers, to my personal chat here on via Zoom. And during Q&A sessions, we will choose several questions to ask the lecturers. And we will think later uh, in the end of the uh, meeting what to do with the rest of the questions and how we can give the response to it. Okay. And the third one, uh, just you will receive your um, uh, certificates. Um, uh, so uh, I will try to send you certificates wow. during one or two weeks after the meetings. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry for, for much taking your time. Thank you. Thank you, Daria, very useful information. And Professor Morozo, would you be so kind to ask to the stage the first lecturer? Yes, I am ready. Thank you. Let's start our work and I'm, I'm very happy to introduce you the first speaker, which is Dina Popovich, PhD. Uh, from Israel and I have a privilege and honor to work with Dina some years ago. We did a CMP seminar in the Volgograd. I have a very good souvenir. I remember she's hard worker uh, because um, one of our lecturer Miss uh, Plain and uh, Dina really worked for two. Now I do hope that this time we will be um, more and more gentle to her, not to <laughs> overwork, over, um, give no some uh, extra work that time. But uh, just a few words about um, Dina. Um, Dina Popovich has received her degree in medicine cum laude from the University of Bologna in Italy and has specialized in the psychiatry, was awarded at a PhD with the international label Dr. Europeus in neuroscience in uh, neuroendocrine metabolic disorder at the University of Pisa in uh, Italy also. Uh, then uh, Dr. Popovich has completed her postdoctorate training and performed clinical research at biologic, um, bipolar disorder program of Hospital Clinic University of Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain, headed by Professor Vieta. Three years, um, Dr. Popovich has served as a chief of psychiatry being Sheba Medical Center in Israel, head of bipolar disorder program, and currently uh, as medical assistant director of psychiatric hospital Arab Banel in Israel. Uh, in scientific interest and publications primarily include mood and psychotic disorder and suicide. And Dr. Pop Popovich um, has an interest to the research in the field of psychopharmacology, genetic, neurophysiological aspect of mood disorder. And I just uh, remind you the title of presentation of Dr. Popovich is Individualized Treatment of Bipolar Disorder. Please, Dina. Sound. We have some sound problem. Yeah. There we go. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, first of all, uh, Peter, for these kind words. In fact, um, I have wonderful memories from, uh, from our seminar in Volgograd, and I certainly hoped uh, to come back to Russia. 
so this time it won't be physical, but at least uh, in a way we are connected again. So I'm very happy for that. And uh, I will always remember a great hospitality. And uh, I would like, of course, to thank again the whole organizing committee for the great work. And uh, of course, to Professor Kostas Puntulakis. Uh, so I will, sh uh, the, as, pro as Professor Mazolov said, I'm, uh, the topic of my speech is uh, individualized treatment of bipolar disorder. So I will uh, just try to, yes. Are the slides big enough for you to see? So first of all, uh, this is my conflict of interest. Uh, of course, for this presentation, there are no conflicts to declare. Dina, you can uh, make full screen uh, your PowerPoint. That would be even... I uh, tried, but it had some problems for some you have You have Mac, right? Yes. Yes, uh, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Do, no personal, <laughs> don't get into personal lines because Mac is great. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. So um, maybe I can also at least close these. Okay. Well, the good thing about everybody having their PCs in front of them is that they can um, put it a little bit closer uh, because uh, unfortunately for technical reasons, uh, I couldn't get, do better than this. <laughs> for. Uh, so bipolar disorder is, um, is an episodic, episodic and chronic uh, by, uh, psychiatric disorder with important morbidity and mortality. Uh, its natural history is characterized by a relatively early onset, a lifelong high risk of recurrences, frequent biphasic episodes, uh, for example, mania followed by depression, uh, high rates of incomplete remission, considerable chronicity, and very important suicidal risk, about 20, 20 times higher than the general population. So the main issues in bipolar disorder are um, basically two. One is how to make the correct diagnosis, and second, how to decide which treatment is most adapt for each patient. And, uh, uh, and the diagnosis is particularly uh, complicated in bipolar disorder. In fact, it is one of the most misdiagnosed and underrecognized uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, the, the main two fields where uh, it, it may be confused um, at the beginning, of, at the onset of the disorder, are of course psychosis and major depressive disorder. As to psychosis, uh, over 50% of adolescents who are uh, diagnosed as psychotic in their, uh, at the beginning of the episodes are actually diagnosed as bipolar, uh, as affected with bipolar disorder later on. Uh, similarly, uh, the, uh, regarding unipolar depression, which is probably the more, most tricky field, uh, we know that uh, depressive onset is three times more common than manic onset. So very often we, we receive patients with initial depressive episode and it is mistakenly taken for and treated as a unipolar depression. In fact, initial diagnosis can take over 10 years. And in particular, in patients with depressive uh, predominant polarity, we have a typically delay of seven to 10 years. What complicates things, of course, is uh, the absence of previous episodes. Uh, also, often the patients will not report uh, any hypomanic symptoms in the past. Uh, there is uh, the, the, present the symptomatic presentations are very different. And also the patients themselves, there is no one type uh, of uh, bipolar patient. Uh, there is an important overlap, as we said before, with psychotic and other affective disorders, in addition to ADHD and also others. And finally, the comorbidity with other psychiatric disorders is very common. So when, uh, one of the problems for us is that when we see a patient, we see the patient at isolated points in time. Uh, what we don't see is everything that goes Meanwhile, like you can see the, the movie playing down, the, down, the picture that we get of patients when we see them are at baseline after one month, three months, six months, and they don't really are not representative of everything that the patient has been through in the meanwhile. 
that we know that uh, about 40 to 60 percent of patients, even treated patients, relapse after the first episode, with about one half of patients experiencing second mood episode within a year of recovery, and 80 percent within five years. Inadequate treatment will contribute to increased rates of relapse, and multiple episodes will increase the patient's vulnerability to develop new episodes. They will reduce patient's response to therapy. They will have an impact on psychosocial functioning, and also number of episodes increases morbidity and mortality. Uh, as, um, as it was known for some years now, the rate of relapses increases with number of previous episodes. So the, the earlier that we, uh, that we give the correct treatment to the patient and try to prevent new episodes or recognize correctly prodromic symptoms and try to block the episode before happening, uh, it, will, uh, it will increase, uh, it will make a patient's prognosis better. Likewise, we know that the response to treatment is much more favorable in the earlier stages of bipolar disorder. Uh, in this graph, you can see the results relative to uh, olanzapine studies, but it is true to pretty much all, uh, all the drugs. And not only even psychological uh, interventions have a better, much better, give a much better result uh, earlier on. Now, when we Tend to, when we try to give a pharmacological treatment, uh, first of all, we, are ba we based everything on our personal knowledge. There are very little objective tests or ways to help us make a decision. So the problem is that when we look at what, uh, at what we know, we, this is, for example, this graph represents, of course, an antidepressant. And we see that after three to four weeks, we have, uh, uh, we see that the symptoms, depressive symptoms are half what they used to be, etc. And this is what we explain the patients when we see them. The problem with this is that this lovely graph that you see is actually the result of this. So these blue things are actually our patients. So to expect the patient to fall on the perfect line can be, but it is not necessarily so. So we always have to keep that in mind when we explain the patients about the treatment that they will receive. For this reason, uh, nowadays we're moving from blockbuster medicine towards stratified medicine, which is a treatment based on the use of molecular information to select the best therapeutic strategy in order to improve the, the treatment of patients with similar biological characteristics. So uh, the, the problem with the Zoom uh, presentations is that you can't really involve the public. Uh, so I will just try to give questions and answers alone. So um, are there any biomarkers in psychiatric diagnosis in bipolar disorder or any other psychiatric diagnosis? And the answer is unfortunately not. So at the moment, there are no tested, reproducible, clinically useful biomarkers in psychiatry. Genetic findings are statistical associations of risk, but they are not diagnostic of the disease. Neuroimaging findings report mean group uh, characteristics, but not individual differences between uh, patients. And finally, metabolic findings are not specific. Sorry, problem with it progression of the slides. Okay, so much for technology. Okay, I'll do it. So one of the newest, most modern paths that everything is, the whole attention is now turning towards is the so-called machine learning or artificial intelligence or, a few, or deep learning, a few more uh, words for that. And uh, the, first, um, the first time that we started talking about the application of machine learning in, uh, in medicine in general was, with, uh, was when they asked a certain number of ophthalmologists to, if they can distinguish by just looking at retina of a patient, what you see now in the picture, 
if based on that, they can uh, guess if the person in picture is male or female. And the results were maybe not surprisingly about 50% got it right. I mean, it is categorical, it is yes or no. Those were the chances, that's what happened. And then they tried, they put these scans in the computer, they gave it data and the computer was asked to predict the same thing. And the computer is actually able to predict not only the, uh, se the sex of the person in the front, but also things such as blood pressure, pulse, smoking status, uh, uh, et cetera. And in fact, uh, there was, there were uh, already, there are, uh, the, by retinal scans, it is possible to predict uh, heart disease and risk factors to it. Uh, for example, this is a prediction that it does. Uh, it predicted uh, blood pressure of uh, 148 and the actual blood pressure is 148.5. So it actually gives very good uh, prediction and is, has already been finding uses. Uh, retinal trajectory was also checked in the context of psychiatric disorders. So in this paper, uh, the first papers in fact on machine learning and psychiatry uh, go back to 2018-2019. Uh, and so uh, in this study, they have examined the, res the, re uh, the retinal vascular trajectory, and they were able to distinguish, to predict, uh, the, uh, to distinguish healthy volunteers from psychiatric patients suffering from bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Unfortunately, when they tried to distinguish between these two disorders, it wasn't possible to do. But this, in my personal opinion, may be also due to the fact that often psychiatric diagnosis tells more about the doctor than about the patient. Another, uh, another uh, interested implication uh, of uh, machine learning, these are already apps that are available at the moment. This is, for example, patients with anemia that can only, or not with anemia, but it's possible just to take a picture of your fingernails and you will get the, the, um, you, uh, the levels of hemoglobin in the, in the blood. So instead of being uh, needles and tests, etc., this is something that is definitely changing the face of medicine as we know it. Uh, likewise, there is this um, uh, the study that was performed in China that uh, pretty much they are able to, uh, in the ER of a, psychiatric, of a general hospital, uh, in, the, in the waiting room, they're able to distinguish people who are suffering from anemia only ba based on the cam on what the cameras take. So it is something that is very important in order to to be able to do correct triage of patients with uh, who need urgent attention and those who who do not. Furthermore, there are already also the Apple Watch allows you to also control your, um, uh, to, to uh, the heart rate and thus also to detect our, uh, atrial fibrillation. In the context of bipolar disorder, uh, there are also some variables that are used, some of them uh, for research, others which are available also for, uh, for patients. And pretty much what they managed to collect is data regarding uh, the circadian rhythms, the sleep pattern, uh, the levels of energy, how much you move, how much you talk, et cetera, et cetera. Other implications uh, of machine learning, such as football, uh, being able to predict how players, the moves that players will make during the game. Uh, also, the facial recognition has important um, role in uh, politics and in uh, policing. Uh, here, for example, this is also from China, the, the, also the ability to find a person in a crowd, etc. But in the context of preventing policing that is already active in different uh, countries, uh, it is possible to predict where the crime will take place and who will carry it out. So in the States, for example, they are trying already to use it to go to people and to tell them, uh, hello, your son is uh, at risk of performing this crime in the near future, et cetera, et cetera. Which is uh, there, of course, it opens a uh, place for a long debate, uh, but the fact is that it is already used. 
also in political elections uh, and in the US, probably also in Israel, uh, machine learning was used highly uh, and may have also influenced results of elections. And uh, to go back a little bit to comfort ourselves with psychiatry, uh, also there is a study uh, show uh, looking for psychiatric comorbidity in patients with epilepsy. And also here, they were um, they, uh, the machine learning classifier based on the language was uh, enabled this day to distinguish these uh, comorbidities in patients with epilepsy. And of course, uh, there are most of the studies that we have on machine learning are in the context of, uh, of predicting suicidality. Also here, there are quite a few papers and uh, which have, uh, such as looking for words which are most correlated with suicidality in order to be able to know what, uh, who to hospitalize, et cetera. And um, as, as I was taught is that uh, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Uh, so I will show you our small contribution to the machine learning um, it, due to the fact that in psychiatry, as we said before, there are absolutely no routine tests, uh, such as those that are used in every other branch of, uh, of medicine. For this reason, novel computerized methods may help uh, by, means, by using things like speech, can help to identify and predict the, the correct diagnosis in patients. So uh, uh, this study that we performed aimed to test whether uh, on, based on 10 minutes of patient's free speech, we can predict if the patient has a psychiatric disorder, and if yes, whether he, he or she are psychotic or not, uh, currently and in the past. So we have assessed the patients by a variety of scales, and then we asked them to tell us to talk for 10 minutes about things like important challenges in their life, uh, the story, tell us the story of Little Red Riding Hood, any meaningful event, or describe what shaped their concept of God and religion, which of course is particularly interesting in psychotic patients. Uh, and then uh, we took every word that the patient said, and uh, we tried to see how close is the word that comes after that. In, uh, in the sense that, for example, mother and father is much semantically closer than mother and camel. Okay. So for this reason, we have looked about, uh, at the word coming after each patient's word, and, the, uh, and we compared the whole sentences with the following two sentences. And uh, so we pretty much uh, draw, it, it draw the um, uh, logarithm, uh, and uh, sorry, a vector, and then we saw how the vector of the word after it or the sentence after it, how close or far it was. And then we got this presentation. Um, unfortunately, this is only a very shallow pre uh, presentation, and in the computer, it is multi dimensional, it's not even 3D or 4D, it goes way be beyond that. So, in the space, they draw all the words. And the computer tell, um, gives, gives us the, the results. We use, um, and then we, uh, we also looked at features of different sentences and the correlation between them. And uh, here, as I told you, we compared healthy controls to patients uh, with psychiatric diagnosis without psychotic symptoms and patients with psychotic symptoms. Uh, we saw there were no uh, differences regarding age, sex, uh, there, were, there were differences regarding, of course, suicidal ideation, regarding uh, uh, as well as suicide attempts, uh, and education, which is probably the factor that is most, more disturbing for us. And um, finally, uh, uh, the difference between every word and the word after is the one that helped us distinguish between these groups. Uh, these are partial uh, results. We have increased a little bit the, um, uh, we have increased the sample to 30, 30, and 30 patients. Uh, here we had about 10 patients missing, and uh, the accuracy that we found was of 96%, which is, 
with 83% specificity, specificity and 100% uh, um, sensitivity. Here also we looked at the cases that were misdiagnosed and it was very interesting to see that two of the healthy controls uh, were talking about um, very traumatic uh, events from uh, their life and uh, that they present, they were never treated and never went to doctor for it. But after I talked to them afterwards, uh, they had clear symptoms of uh, PTSD. Uh, one uh, was a student nurse who um, was there as healthy control, also never got treatment, but she had postpartum depression. And one, which was something I was most scared of because it was my head nurse at the time I was head of department and my head nurse was diagnosed as, um, as a psychiatric patient. And this is, however, probably due to the fact that she wasn't a native speaker. So after this, we have increased the, we have increased the sample uh, and taken out all not native speakers. Uh, so automated analysis of free speech is an innovative approach, which may permit to finally be able to have an objective diagnosis in psychiatry. And it is a value and computational psychiatry in general is a valuable field which really needs to be further explored and it seems like we're there now. So to get back to uh, other uh, ways that we have to choose patients uh, treatment, uh, it is possible at the moment, as we said, that really personalized medicine is not possible, but we're moving towards stratified medicine. So in, in bipolar disorder, we can stratify patients in different ways, such as according to psychopathological markers, genetics and uh, epigenetics and the phenotypes. Uh, if we apply the staging model uh, of different mood, uh, uh, which takes into consideration the number of episodes patients have had, uh, patients can be uh, stratified by predominant polarity, by presence of comorbidities and by presence of mixed features, and probably there will be also other ways to stratify them. And the most, uh, something that uh, all of us have in hand uh, and uh, is easy to know, it is uh, the drugs that we use. So here in the next few slides, I will summarize what is the data that was published regarding clinical markers of response to treatment. So uh, the, the first drug to be advised for treatment of bipolar disorder uh, and still the most effective one is lithium. Uh, lithium, in fact, is the gold standard. So we will also, the, the following uh, drugs will be all compared to lithium. Uh, we know that uh, lith the patients who respond best to lithium are those with classic Kripalinian uh, form of illness where, whose, uh, whose uh, illness is characterized by episodes of mania, followed by depression, followed by the free interval. Uh, patients also uh, with, uh, and especially this with mania depression pattern, responds better, for example, than depression mania pattern. Uh, also patients who respond better to lithium are those with less uh, comorbid uh, pathologies without rapid cycling, it is more efficacious in euphoric mania rather than dysphoric mania. Also, there is a very strong correlation with family members. So if somebody's uh, father was a great responder to, to lithium, uh, it is very probable that the child will also respond to it. Also, we need to keep in mind that lithium has a peculiar pattern because we know that one third of uh, patients are excellent responders to lithium meaning they will have no further episodes in the next uh, 10 years. We have paid one third that are good responders to lithium, uh, which need an additional a mood stabilizer or, um, uh, or, uh, or, or do have some episodes. And then we have non-responders, which is also a third. And uh, interestingly, also in animal models, uh, in, uh, the, um, uh, in mice models, you can see exactly the same pattern of response. Other characteristics that, that correlate with a good and excellent response to lithium is later age at onset, lower hospitalization day, uh, rate. Uh, regarding uh, affective temperaments, patients with hypertimic personality tend to respond better to lithium, while there is a negative correlation with cyclotimic and anxious uh, temperaments. 
Uh, and also patients who respond better are those with preserved cognitive fa functions and lack of cognitive disorganization. Regarding carbamazepine, which was the second drug to be advised for bipolar disorder, and surprisingly, we still don't have any uh, maintenance trials on carbamazepine in bipolar disorder. Uh, whatsoever, regarding the characteristics, it seems that patients who respond better to carbamazepine than to lithium are those with higher psychiatric comorbidity, with mood incongruent delusions, patients with EEG pathology and structural brain changes. Also patients uh, with bipolar disorder type two seem to respond uh, in, uh, pretty, with pretty same rates to lithium and to carbamazepine, while patients with bipolar one tend to, to uh, respond better to lithium. And uh, as to valproate, uh, there, there is some data suggesting that patients with atypical features may respond better to valproate and patients with more manic or mixed episodes. Regarding lamotrigine, uh, which we know, uh, the patients who tend to respond better are those with chronic course of illness, with rapid cycling, patients with comorbid anxiety disorders, in particular panic disorder, and also with substance abuse, and patients with family history of schizoaffective disorder, uh, panic disorder, and recurrent depression. As to clinical uh, factors of response to uh, clozapine, uh, we know that who responds better to, to clozapine than to other drugs are patients with severe manic episodes with psychomotor agitation and psychotic symptoms of great intensity. I apologize. Okay. Uh, regarding uh, state specifiers, also here, the, the drugs I'm presenting here have, been, uh, have data uh, that shows that, but it is possible that there are also other drugs that can be effective. For example, for mixed episodes, we have uh, evidence that, that, luraz that lurazidone, olanzapine, and lisenapine uh, uh, may have uh, utility, but it is probable that also uh, drugs such as quetiapine uh, may also be helpful. Uh, agitation in mania, we have uh, trials on loxapine staccato, which is the inhalatory loxapine, uh, used for rapid cal calming of agitation, uh, asenapine, aripiprazole, and uh, regarding high suicidal risk, of course, the number one drug is lithium, and also uh, there is evidence about clozapine. Another way to stratify patients is according to predominant polarity. Predominant polarity uh, is present in about one half of patients, and we can uh, uh, and we diagnose it when at least two thirds of patients' past episodes have been depression or mania hypomania. Meaning that, if, for example, if patient has had two depressive episodes and uh, four or five manic episodes, the chances are that he will tend to develop other uh, manic uh, episodes in the future. So when we decide the treatment we always have to try to predict also how the, uh, the future will be. Uh, patients, there are also um, differences in uh, clinical differences between these two groups of patients. Uh, they do correlate with uh, onset of illness. Uh, depressive polarity correlates also with uh, bipolar disorder type two and more years undiagnosed. Regarding manic polarity, uh, these patients present uh, more frequently substance misuse, more psychotic symptoms, higher hospitalization rates, and more cognitive impairment, while patients with depressive polarity uh, have more suicide attempts, more seasonal pattern, and uh, more often melancholic features. Well, they say that the bipolarists, uh, as probably all the others, tend to see bipolar everywhere, uh, this is an example. Uh, on the left, you can see a building in, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, actually close to where I live, which in my opinion is definitely in a manic episode. And then during a Congress in Sibiu in Romania, they took me to the square where all the houses, uh, the windows on the roof uh, are uh, called eyes that watch you. So if that isn't, if it isn't psychotic symptoms, it is, it induces them in other people. So uh, now to move on, first of all, when we uh, need to decide a drug, 
we have to look at the efficacy of the drug. So uh, in order to report efficacy of a drug, uh, we usually use, it is recommendable to use a number needed to treat, which is a, me a measure of effect size that tells us how many patients we need to treat with a certain drug to have one true responder to that drug. Uh, the smaller the number needed to treat, the better, and only number needed to treat inferior to 10 are considered clinically meaningful. So some years ago, uh, we assessed or the number, we calculated number need to treat for all the, uh, the, the drugs that were advised as first line treatment of bipolar disorder in all of the studies. So we saw that of course, that uh, all the drugs in order to be approved and indicated as first line treatment, they needed uh, to, ha to have uh, an efficacy in prevention of any mood episode with number needed to treat inferior to 10. And it was so. However, we also noticed here that there was an important difference uh, between their ability to prevent mania or depression or both. So uh, we introduced a metric called polarity index, uh, which, is, which tells us how much anti-manic or antidepressive a drug is based on its number needed to treat. So polarity index of one tells us the drug has equal uh, efficacy in prevention of mania and or depression. Polarity index uh, larger than one is predominantly anti-manic and uh, inferior to one is predominantly antidepressive. So uh, if we look at the graphic presentation of that, uh, we saw that, uh, that of course, that um, uh, regarding predominantly antidepressive polarity index, uh, we have data regarding lamotrigine. Uh, quetiapine was the most, um, had equal efficacy in prevention of mania and depression, followed by lithium, which was also slightly more antimanic than antidepressive. And then we had a typical antipsychotics. And here we saw that the affinity for uh, D2 receptors correlated with, number, with uh, polarity index. Uh, after doing that for uh, drugs, uh, we have a uh, calculated number need to treat and polarity index for also all the trials on uh, psychological uh, interventions. And here we saw also that the interventions that were more antidepressive were especially CBT and psychoeducation. And those were interventions that worked with the patient. While the, inter and, uh, while the interventions that worked for uh, family, uh, for caregivers, uh, are, were more anti-manic, which is pretty logical because, of course, patient will really like to come to the doctor once he's depressed, but will definitely not want to feel good and tell patient, come to doctor, tell him, hey, let me feel less good. So here, the role of family and of caregivers is extremely important. And uh, just to, to check it, we applied the polarity index first at, uh, to our patients in, um, in Barcelona, um, the polar disorders program. And we saw that in fact, uh, when we looked respectively to the, to the treatment the patients were receiving, we saw that the polarity index was higher. Uh, also, regard, when we took calculated polarity index of all the drugs patients took, but also when we separated antipsychotics and mood stabilizer, still the polarity index was higher in patients with manic predominant polarity. Uh, just a um, quick uh, review regarding the staging model that I mentioned before. Uh, some years ago, uh, Michael Burke and Flavio Kapsinski have developed two ways to classify bipolar disorder, to stage bipolar disorder. So from the model of, uh, that we know from oncology, for example, it is also possible to stage patients uh, going from stage zero with latent uh, disorder uh, to, uh, to stage four with refractory to treatment uh, without any remission uh, cases. And also I added to, uh, to this the biomarkers that can be seen, especially neuroinflammatory biomarkers and BDNF, which can be seen in each stage of uh, illness. And uh, now a short review also in the context of personalized treatment. 
uh, genetic, from genetics, we have uh, data on different genes uh, regarding, which can correlate, uh, first of all, to side effects, and, but also probably to efficacy, meaning, the, uh, and, and can tell us how quickly patient, uh, patients metabolize a certain drug. So uh, in the last years, these uh, neuropharmacogenetic tests have evolved and uh, they use the, the genes that were found to be correlated to response or tolerability with at least five levels of evidence. And uh, so by taking patient's DNA sample, uh, they send back a report where they ex uh, with a table uh, showing in green the drugs that patient uh, is likely to respond to and will give few side effects those to use with caution and also explain what are the, the problems. And uh, the red ones, uh, which may, requ may require much, much more frequent monitoring and cautious use, and also, if possible, to avoid them. Uh, so after these tests have appeared, first of all, there was quite a lot of enthusiasm, also because um, here is uh, the consideration of pharmacy costs. So of course, if you don't need to try different drugs, but you can have um, be closer to, to choosing the right drug, it has uh, an effect on uh, costs, but also, and especially for us also as professionals and for the patients themselves, they get the correct treatment earlier on. Uh, and then in, uh, there, was, um, it, it, there was this peak of uh, tests, and it was suggested that uh, science may, may have gotten a bit left behind in this uh, race to uh, develop new pharmacogenetic tests and to convince the doctor to use that specific test rather than another one. Uh, so this, uh, in late 2017, as was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry about the eventual misleading guidance. And, uh, but uh, also here we need to keep in, uh, in mind that also it needs to be interpreted by a physician. So if you're a psychiatrist, and of course you know uh, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of a drug, giving you information about, uh, for example, CYP3A4 uh, being uh, uh, lower or higher, can help you choose the right doses and uh, even consider uh, drugs which use or do not use that specific metabolism. Uh, I'm sorry, they have, okay, for some reason it kicked me out. Okay, let's see if we're back here, okay. And uh, so uh, also just a year after the American Journal uh, publication, actually FDA went to the other side and they have decided to authorize also direct to consumer tests. Uh, this, uh, for example, may be useful in countries where uh, there are no pharmacogenetic tests because patients can order these tests and do, it, do them at home. Uh, also, actually, I, I did talk to people whose job this is from the lab point of view. And here uh, they have, um, uh, and here what we saw is that uh, these tests, uh, as they say, are probably less uh, accurate than the pharmacogenetic tests that you send to a, to a specific lab who does this. But still, it's an option. Other technological options in uh, the field of bipolar disorder and psychiatry, and this was used in some studies, was, uh, the, um, uh, was putting a microchip in the drug itself in order to be able to monitor uh, patients' adherence to treatment. But this, uh, as far as I know, has been used just in a few trials some years back. And then another uh, modern uh, thing was the, uh, were the smartphone apps. So in, also in the past years, it has been presented on most congresses and there was lots of talk of the apps. But the question always remained whether they work or not. So the answer to this question is that it depends what you look for. Uh, so regarding efficacy, when we looked on all the, these are the five largest studies, including apps, and we can see that the efficacy in the terms of reduction of symptoms 
was either not proven or proven not to be there. So that is the bad news. The better news is that while, uh, for example, if we do look at these two largest clinical trials, uh, while there was no uh, significant effect on symptom reduction, which was the primary aim. However, there were significant effects on quality of life and perceived stress. Also in this app that was uh, developed in Barcelona, which uh, uses, it's all, it also monitors, but also it gives patients tips from psychoeducation to, to let them know what, also what to do when things happen. Uh, when it was assessed, we saw that, uh, that there was, and also here, it did not reduce the symptoms, of course, but it had effects on adherence to treatment and improved circadian rhythms. By the way, this is a free app. It is available also in English. So also here in Israel, I've been encouraging my patients to use it. And uh, also, especially the younger ones are pretty enthusiastic about that. And in conclusion, a bipolar disorder is a complex uh, condition that, however, can be effectively managed under the paradigm of personalized medicine. Patients can be stratified about, uh, according to biological, clinical, and staging features. Polarity index is a measure of relative prophylactic efficacy of drugs and may be a useful tool to guide maintenance treatment according to predominant polarity. Uh, the potential of digital psychiatry tools has uh, evoked not few hopes. Despite some encouraging results, research in the field has not been translated to, uh, to real-world clinical settings yet. And uh, computational psychiatry is a valuable field which needs to be further explored. Artificial intelligence will probably change the face of psychiatry, medicine, and the world as we know it. And uh, finally, I just want to thank you for your attention and to tell uh, to thank the um, the hospital where I work now, which is the Barbanel Mental Health Center, uh, and my team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dina. Thank you very much. Um, so the floor is open for discussion. Um, um, may I ask uh, Daria. Yes, uh, Professor Marozo, thank you, Peter Marozo, thank you very much, Dina, for your presentation. We have one question from Russia. They asked, uh, uh, this is Alona uh, Leonova, and she uh, thank you, thanks you for the very interesting and informative presentation. And she asks uh, about the situation in Israel. She says that in Russia, we have a very big issue to overdiagnose schizophrenia compared to bipolar disorder. And what is the situation in Israel compared to Russia? What could you comment about this? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Leona. Uh, uh, well, regarding uh, misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis, sadly, it is true pretty much in the whole world, uh, also in Israel. Uh, I also came back to Israel four years ago, so I wasn't sure what I will find. And uh, I was working before that in two tertiary centers which focus on bipolar disorder. So we got kind of screened patients. Here um, I had, um, the situation is probably not as bad as in, uh, as in some places as I have seen, but still it is hugely misdiagnosed. As a head of department, I have had lots of patients uh, to whom I have changed diagnosis after years of having diagnosis of schizophrenia, and then I changed it slightly to schizoaffective disorder, and then after <laughs> some more time to bipolar disorder. And uh, unfortunately also uh, the treatment is like that, because if you give a bipolar patient, anti, uh, if you give them antipsychotic, especially uh, first uh, generation antipsychotics, uh, they will, anybody, also healthy, uh, also healthy people, will uh, develop something that is pretty similar to negative symptoms or, sub, or depressive symptoms. And this will only serve to convince 
the, the treating uh, psychiatrist that this was true, that the patient was schizophrenic and he has now, now uh, negative symptoms. So what you raise is in fact is one of the major issues. Uh, unfortunately also in Israel, the situation is not as I would like it to be. Uh, but let's hope with it with more awareness and also more uh, congresses like this who are available to many people, it will help to promote a little bit and to understand better diagnosis and treatment of bipolar disorder. Uh, thank you very much, Dina. There is also one question from Dr. Makesh uh, Ambani. He thanks for your wonderful presentation again. And his question is, uh, what is the role of neuroimaging in diagnosis of bipolar disorder? What do you think? Okay, thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, actually, I have it in uh, backup slides, uh, which I had to cut down, but eventually I can show you. The problem is that neuroimaging was also something that we really hoped um, uh, put high hopes in that uh, in the past. Um, However, we from neuroimaging we can get some general information, uh, mostly on uh, things such as uh, dilatation of lateral ventricles, etc. However, it cannot help us to diagnose bipolar disorder or to be sure that that the diagnosis is correct. Um, we, there are a few things that we have definitely learned in the terms of uh, research from neuroimaging, but as to diagnosis, yeah, it's here somewhere, but um, I don't want to, to lose other speakers' time to, to look at it. Uh, yes, so um, there are quite a few things, especially uh, after the, um, uh, the MRI, the fMRI era has helped us to understand that first of all, also uh, some of the alterations that are present also in euthymia, and also to help us um, uh, by diffusion te uh, the, the techniques have helped us to understand the networks, neuronal networks that are impaired in bipolar disorder. So we have definitely received some data on the illness itself and on the ways of uh, that can explain also some of the symptoms and uh, progression of disease, etc. But unfortunately, not enough uh, regarding. But it is absolutely not enough in order to diagnose or confirm diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, also, Dina, there is a question about the recent modern um, guidelines about how long can you uh, prescribe lithium because uh, we have many complications after lithium and uh, people can be on dialysis and on dialysis and during this COVID time they have a, a big, uh, you know, uh, 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 the death rate, uh, so it's very vulnerable state for this category of patients. So uh, what would you comment about this um, uh, recent guidelines on how long lithium could be prescribed to patients in bipolar disorder? Thank you very much. Uh, it is um, actually a question I'm very happy to respond to. The thing is that, first of all, uh, it, uh, there are many things to do in order not to get to uh, renal insufficiency. And it is absolutely possible and you have to do it. Uh, so there is no time in general. We also know some very positive effects such as reducing incidence of dementia. Patients who take uh, lithium uh, are uh, usually bipolar patients have higher chances of developing dementia. Uh, in uh, patients who are under lithium have lower chances of, of developing dementia also than people with uh, others with bipolar disorder, but also reduces it under the levels of general population. So lithium has also uh, important neuroprotective uh, functions. Also Costas, there was a paper, I remember that he wrote uh, different years ago with uh, Edward Vieta uh, about uh, neurotoxic or neuroprotective uh, qualities of lithium. But uh, the thing is that uh, I, used to, I tend to give a relatively low doses of lithium. There is no strong evidence that higher doses 
uh, it really increase efficacy, but they do cause side effects. Uh, I tend to give, to, to try to keep the levels of lithiemia about 0, 0.5, 0, 0.6. Uh, side effects, such as, for example, tremor, will appear at 0, 0.7. There is no higher efficacy, so why, why should we do it? We need to have really also good tolerability in order to have patients continue with lithium. So there is uh, also, we have insufficient data regarding for how long, for example, after first episode, how long do we need to continue treatment? Uh, so also there, are, uh, there is some evidence that it should be after first episode, continued at least for a year, after second episode, also for three years. But remember that 80, 85% of people will have other episodes, even if treated. And if we tell this to the patient, he will be sure that he's in that group of 10% who will not have other episodes and leave treatment, okay? We have about 70% about of patients with bipolar disorder who stop their treatment autonomously. Uh, lithium is also, um, there is, uh, when it is also a drug which is pretty dangerous to interrupt bruntly, also for the increase, rebound increase of suicidal ideation, and also uh, because of tachyphylaxis, the response will not uh, be as good after you stop treatment and start it again. So what I do advise is careful monitoring. You really need to do all the blood tests if there is any, uh, if there are problems with kidneys, uh, don't be afraid to consult a nephrologist. Uh, see if that is due to lithium, not. When it is, we try to lower the doses to see if it works, and if not, change the drug. I think that it is bad practice to let people, and we have had also patients who were insisting on continuing lithium because they were good only on that, even after there was some, um, that some impairment of kidney functioning. Uh, with these, for example, I, I would not agree to that, but this is also the situation. We, but we have to just monitor really carefully, also thyroid, also kidneys, levels of lithium in the blood, and uh, if treating correctly, these long-term side effects are, can be found in time and the drug changed, so we can prevent it, and we can avoid it by also by a careful monitoring of the lithium levels. But absolutely, I wouldn't put a deadline on the use of lithium. There are patients also with uh, other, such as epilepsy, who have been the whole life with these treatments. And also regarding lithium, many bipolar patients who have been successfully treated have kept these uh, lifelong without any, um, any medical problems. Oh, Dina, thank you very much. There are questions coming and coming, but maybe uh, one short uh, more question uh, from Arsene Arturoni. Isn't personality disorder another determinant in the individualized treatment uh, and diagnosis of bipolar disorder? What will you comment? Thank you very this? much. Absolutely, yes. Uh, also, when we talked about different comorbidities, also personality disorder are uh, frequent comorbidity. It is also, uh, it can be also um, a place to give incorrect diagnosis because there are some uh, patients that I will see as bipolar and colleague who does personality disorders will be sure that uh, she's a borderline, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, Of course, it needs to be taken into consideration also when, uh, when prescribing drugs. So for example, uh, in, uh, if there is a comorbid uh, borderline personality disorder, for example, I do tend to choose a mood stabilizer, which will work also on impulsivity, such as carbamazepine. So always we have to take into consideration all eventual uh, comorbidities, including personality disorders. Oh, thank you very much, Dina. And uh, one last question, please. Uh, the military nurses and also several uh, participants ask the same question. Uh, which uh, um, machine learning program used, was used in the analysis of free speech in patients with psychosis? And I would also add, uh, if you found this uh, semantic similarity or dissimilarity, how it uh, 
you know, was presented in uh, psychotic and non psychotic uh, groups you um, studied. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I wanted to say also if there are other questions or more detailed questions, you can use my email that I, uh, yes. that I wrote. Uh, we have um, uh, we have created an algorithm on Python uh, based on publications uh, by Bedi et al. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see that also as a citation, and we have developed um, this algorithm. Uh, the person who did it with me was a student of mine uh, who is now head of Microsoft here in Israel, uh, and so they stole him. For, so I'm a resident short, but we do a lot of work together. So also if there are more technical uh, questions, uh, we can also, I can also pass you his email and uh, we can see that together. Regarding the diagnosis, uh, in order to stay and to save some time, some more time for questions. So I cut out uh, some of the slides and uh, what we found uh, in also the technical part, I cut out a bit. And also, just a second, where did I put it? Uh, regarding the patients that we had, uh, we have found pretty much difference. The, um, the prediction was much higher for patients uh, to distinguish between healthy controls and the two groups of patients with psychotic symptoms and those without psychotic symptoms together. Uh, it, it, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the accuracy was lower in detection of psychotic symptoms, but it is still possible. There was, uh, uh, it, there was also about 90% accuracy or 88% sorry, percent accuracy to distinguish between healthy controls and uh, psychotic patients. Uh, but for example, between bipolar, between, uh, sorry, non-psychotic and psychotic, there were much less. And if the question was regarding diagnosis, it was also, I, I have that data as well on a slide and we somehow, okay, lost it in the cut and paste uh, of, yeah, I'll say today. But uh, pretty much what we had was in psychotic disorders, we had patients with uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, and bipolar uh, disorder with psychotic symptoms, mostly mania, and one depression with psychotic symptoms. And we had in, um, and, uh, in patients who were not uh, psychotic, we had anxiety disorders, PTSD, uh, OCD, and uh, bipolar disorder uh, who, patients who were never uh, psychotic. Dina, thank you very much. And everybody says brilliant lecture, brilliant lecture. So thank you very much once thank again. You very uh, much. And this is my email. So if anybody wants to thank you. write to, with questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Dina. Thank you very much. So, Alec. Thank you, Alec. <laughs>
We will, we will wait for him for a couple of minutes, otherwise I will uh, substitute him with my speech. Yes, and he will uh, catch, us, uh, catch up with us later, but give us a couple of minutes. Daria, did you find him? Actually, Kostos, I don't find him, but maybe uh, Oleg will be able to introduce. If yes. we are waiting for this couple minutes, it's a time for introduction of the speaker. Uh, not, not, not yet, Oleg. Let's wait for a couple of minutes. I sent him an email. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe we can um, we can uh, change the presentation. Otherwise, yes. Yeah. Otherwise, yes. I will I will speak now, and he will. Yes. Yeah. Speak later. Well, in this case, I should introduce you. Uh, <laughs> okay. You know, I think uh, I think uh, you have such a long uh, list uh, for introduction that uh, I take uh, half of your half of your presentation. But um, I think uh, it will be a privilege for me to speak a little bit about your achievement, about your, your, your work and about your way in your, li your psychiatric life because it's really very impressive. I know personally uh, my friend Costa Fontulakis for about 10 years when we were together the ECNP ambassador, me from Russia and he from Greece. So since that time I acquainted with the work of Professor Fontulakis in details. And um, uh, Professor Fontulakis is a professor of psychiatry in the Aristotle University in the Saloniki uh, and in Greece. And um, I would like just to, to underline that uh, he earned his doctorate in, the same, in psychiatry in the same university in the Saloniki. And then he received a three-year fellowship in psychosomatic medicine and one year postdoctoral fellowship for research from the State Scholarship Foundation in Greece. Then uh, uh, later, um, Dr. Fontulakis was a research fellow in the Department of Psychiatry Division of Neuropsychiatry at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And uh, really, Dr. Fontulakis' array of clinical and research interests are very, very large. He teach uh, and investigate uh, um, such topic as general psychiatry, biological psychiatry, psychopharmacology, of course, mood disorders, schizophrenia, and personality disorders. I was very impressed by the number of publications of Professor Fontolakis. He was a co author of more than 400 papers, and more than 250 of them are published in the International Journal of Psychiatry, Lancet, um, British Medical Journal, American Journal of Psychiatry, British Journal of Psychiatry, and so on and so on. And uh, he has among uh, other about 10,000 citations, for instance. And uh, Professor Pontolakis is, is uh, uh, between 25th world expert concerning bipolar disorders among top 50 concerning suicidality. Uh, one of the latest book of Professor Pontolakis was Bipolar Disorders, an Evidence-Based Guide for Manic Depression from Springer Sherlock and co-edit of WP work and the Nonsense Psychiatry Volume 3 and the book Psychobiological or Behavior. And of course, Professor Pontolakis is a member of innumerable number of uh, all leading associations of the world, WP, European Psychiatric Association, APA, CINP, CNP, and so on and so on. Member of number of advisory boards and uh, any, you know, I, I think it's much easier to me to find some a world or European association which Dr. Fontulaki did not participate because he really covered everything in this uh, in the, his activity. And what is, I would like to underline that uh, Professor Fontulaki is, is um, also very, uh, play very, very important role in Greek medicine, in Greek psychiatry in particular. He worked very closely with the Greek Minister of Health Committee for the administrative, economic, and scientific supervision. And um, for instance, um, since uh, 2019, he's a head of mental health section, research in Institute of Greek Medical Association. So, um, 
some international awards like uh, Kreplin Alzheimer Medal of University of Munich and uh, Excellence in Education Award of the World Federation of Psychiatry, um, Society of Biological Psychiatry. And of course, last but not least, uh, Professor Santulakis is the honorary member of the World Psychiatric Association. Well, I took all my time for your to present you. And this is just uh, one third, but I, I have hands. Please, Professor uh, Santulakis, I just remind the title of your presentation, uh, the usefulness and the limitation of antipsychotic treatments in schizophrenia. Trust me, it's very, very, very interesting and stimulating lecture. I, once I have a chance to listen to it, please. I will probably take my time because uh, we cannot find uh, Alan Young. Something happened to him, maybe. So I might uh, have uh, uh, extended time uh, for my presentation. Anyway, we'll see in the process because Daria is trying to uh, reach him. Uh, I will. Uh, talk about schizophrenia, not bipolar disorder, which is my favorite topic for the last few years. Uh, but I will uh, discuss on the issue of antipsychotics, which is uh, a very uh, hot topic uh, for the last few uh, decades. Uh, give me a minute because I cannot find uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, so one of the issues that arose in the last uh, couple of decades was uh, whether uh, psychopharmacological treatment was as efficacious as we used to think and whether uh, we should describe, uh, we should uh, uh, prescribe uh, uh, pharmacological agents for the treatment of major uh, disorders or we should just refrain from them and use alternative approaches and there were a number of people uh, who insisted that uh, we were wrong in our choices and it started uh, maybe in the 90s but uh, it, 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 uh, it reached a peak during the last 10 years. You, re you remember the issue, the 2008 issue with Irvin Kirsch and the dispute over the efficacy of antidepressants. Now that dispute is over now. We know that antidepressants uh, do work. Uh, they are far from uh, satisfactory, but they, they do work. Uh, the problem now has a shift to antipsychotics and uh, a lot of people, a lot of prominent people are very cautious. What we did was a joint effort of the WPA and the CIMP to, um, to develop a report after uh, a systematic review of the evidence to clarify the issue. And that report will be soon published, the next couple of months will be published in the uh, CNS spectrum. Uh, a number of people took part in this particular paper. Of course, uh, Afzal, uh, Professor Kasper Tandon, Carol, who will join us later, Rene Kahn, Christoph Corell, Sigeto, and Hans Jürgen Meller. Uh, you'll see the the, the, the mounting attack on uh, scientific mental health and the scientific way we treat mental disorders. They start from disputing the essence of mental disorder itself and then it goes to the treatment options. And of course, uh, electroconvulsive therapy was the one who uh, attracted most, uh, uh, most attacks. Uh, also, um, uh, psychoanalysis, of course, had its share because it was considered to be some kind of manipulating. But anyway, we are uh, uh, concerned with antipsychotics right now, and the two major uh, pillars of this uh, attack is Joanna Moncrief and Robert Whittaker. Uh, Moncrief is a lecturer uh, somewhere in the UK, while Whittaker is a journalist who hosts the uh, the site Mud in America. 
and they are consistently writing uh, articles against antidepressants and antipsychotics. Their uh, major uh, uh, their major uh, argument is that antipsychotics do much more harm than good. This is much more harm than good. Okay. Now, during the acute phase, the what, we, what one must have in mind when trying to uh, sort out uh, the data and the literature uh, is that when you have naturalistic follow-up studies without control, during the acute phase, you have people who are on antipsychotics and they might remit or not. Now, those in remission include benign cases, include the placebo effect, and of course, the true responders to medication treatment. Now, when it comes to no medication, those in remission are only benign cases and those in the placebo effect and the natural cause of the illness. So essentially, this area here is common to both arms, while this is the characteristic of the uh, treatment uh, result. We need to have this in mind because this shared proportion is usually neglected by those people who try to interpret the outcome of trials in their own way and, for, and to serve their ideology. Uh, it seems that the majority of patients who respond to some kind of intervention, the 30%, two versus one, are because of some kind of placebo effect, while the minority is because of uh, the drug effect. This is why so many people under treatment, under initially successful treatment, uh, tend to relapse after uh, a specific uh, period of time. Now, what is the case we have here? It is the case that treatment with antipsychotics not only is not beneficial, but instead it worsens the long-term outcome in patients with schizophrenia. This is what they say, and that antipsychotic treatment should never be given. Is that so? Uh, you, we, we can summarize the, in, in, in a table with arguments from this, uh, uh, from this paper by Joanna Moncrief. And they concern the discontinuation effect, the so-called discontinuation effect, uh, the brain atrophy issue that antipsychotics cause brain atrophy, uh, the better outcome, so there is one, one study that suggests there is a better outcome in patients of antipsychotics after seven years and that research alternatives are needed. So we can formulate a number of questions. The first question is, are antipsychotics efficacious during the acute phase, the first, the first month, the first two months? Now there is wide agreement, nobody disagrees on that, that during the acute phase, uh, antipsychotics are clearly superior to placebo and efficacious. And this is because we have an abundance of hard data in the, uh, in the form of placebo controlled trials. There is no dispute of that. Uh, there is some reservation, again, by Moncrief, that, okay, there are some patients that might not necessarily need such treatment. Well, this is, this is a not issue in, in medicine in general. There are always people who, who can um, be cured by themselves without any intervention, but this is a very, very small minority. And in this case, we'll see that it is approximately 5%. So you cannot risk 95% for the sake of 5%. When we will have some kind of biological markers that can identify this 5%, yes, okay, then we will 
refrain from prescribing antipsychotics to this very small minority. Uh, <clears throat> now, our certainty that antipsychotics do work covers up to three years after the acute episode. Uh, because we have hard data for this specific uh, time period. Uh, what is rather disappointing is that our data are strong concerning positive symptoms, that is uh, auditory and other kinds of hallucinations and delusions, but not really on negative symptoms, cognitive symptoms, or uh, the rest of the constellation of symptoms of schizophrenia. So, this is solved during the acute phase. There is no doubt and no debate that antipsychotics do work. The next question is, okay, but is this true for all kinds of patients, even for first episodes? Should we, should we wait a little bit to see whether first episode patients will do well? Uh, the, maybe the percentages, the, the, the outcome is different. Uh, the odds are different. There are always uh, once in a life psychotic episodes. There is all all this all all all, all kind of stuff of uh, arguments concerning the first episode patients. <clears throat> now, what we do know uh, through a number of placebo controlled trials is that there is an, a clear efficacy of antipsychotics in first episode patients. The problem is that we don't know whether these are schizophrenic patients, uh, bipolar patients, schizoaffetic patients, uh, or patients that will have a very benign cause with small isolated episodes who will tend to uh, relapse, but still the inter-episode period will have, uh, uh, will have a, 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 a very good uh, functioning. So when you have a patient at your first episode, at his first episode, you don't know what's going to happen in the next few years. However, during the acute phase, the efficacy is definitely positive. Um, yes, probably uh, the first episode seems to be a, a little uh, bit better uh, in terms of outcome, it's 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 more benign in general, but this could be also the result of uh, uh, of a diagnostic bias. You don't know exactly what these patients are diagnostically, and those patients who do not respond to treatment tend to relapse more frequently. Thus, they tend to receive the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Now, theoretically, if you have a patient with schizophrenia and it is a benign case, then this patient could uh, respond very well to antipsychotics and will not receive a definite diagnosis of schizophrenia for the next few years because exactly he will never satisfy or he will not satisfy for several years the criteria of schizophrenia. Now here we have <clears throat> a small detail that everybody should have in mind. Uh, there is a big difference in the diagnostic criteria between DSM and ICD. DSM demands six months of presence of symptoms. Now benign cases of schizophrenia under treatment do not have six months of uh, treatment like that, of uh, symptoms like that. Uh, on the other hand, schizophrenia according to ICD demands only one month. So it's a very much wider uh, definition. And if you use the ICD definition, then schizophrenia becomes a rather moderate to benign uh, disorder, but if you use the DSM definition, then only the most the, the most severe cases will receive such a diagnosis. This is this is a, a pitfall we need to have in mind. Uh, what we also know is that patients who, who, who which are refractory, they tend to be refractory since the beginning. So 40% or more of patients that eventually will be, will be proven to be refractory, are refractory since their first episode, almost half. And there is a high relapse rate, high relapse rate in first episode patients. So if we are very 
much in a hurry to discontinue medication, then this high relapsulate evolves. <clears throat> uh, this is one of our patient, uh, our papers in press currently. And what it says that <clears throat> if you have first episode schizophrenia, not first episode psychosis, but first episode schizophrenia, which was later confirmed that these cases were schizophrenia patients. And this is first episode, this is later episode schizophrenia. And if you compare the trajectories, you can see how much uh, complex these trajectories are and how they, they move from antipsychotic naive to receiving medication, how they, uh, from remission to non-remission, it's, it's all kind of, 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 of complex trajectories that you cannot really see what's going on. And eventually, you to, what you can see is that <clears throat> uh, in remission, there are only a small mi minority of patients and they tend to receive more uh, treatment by uh, passing the years simply because uh, the, 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 the initial optimism that these patients without treatment, these patients will do well uh, evaporates. So you start treating, treating them with antipsychotics, but if this comes after two or three episodes, it might be already too late. So there is, there is an effect of the naturalistic way we treat patients and our treatments do not perform as good as they could. And also we tend to attribute specific diagnosis to more refractory cases. Um, <clears throat> now, the, I, I have covered all these, and let's go to question three, after we resolve the, the first episode. The first episode should receive treatment, and should receive treatment until the, uh, the diagnosis is solidly put. Now, the next question is, is there an antipsychotic discontinuation withdrawal effect? Uh, this means that you have, after you discontinue antipsychotics, you have a rebound psychosis. And this is based on the so-called dopamine supersensitivity hypothesis. Now, uh, what do we know about dopamine and schizophrenia? We know a very few things and often our earlier knowledge seems to be uh, seems to change with newer data. Um, first of all there, there does not seem to be a linear non-linear relationship between D2 occupancy and clinical response or side effects. So what we were saying that uh, we need at least 40% uh, uh, occupancy to have uh, uh, the therapeutic effect and at 60% you have EPS. That does not seem to be the case. Um, the UFEST study destroyed our uh, concept that you can have, uh, at least with uh, typical antipsychotics, you can have uh, a therapeutic effect without having an EPS. Probably what differentiates between a typical and typical antipsychotics is that with typical, with first generation antipsychotics, you need to, to go past the extrapyramidal threshold in order to achieve a therapeutic effect. The therapeutic threshold is above the EPS threshold. While in atypical antipsychotics, in second generation antipsychotics, this is vice versa. So you can achieve an antipsychotic effect without crossing the extrapyramidal threshold. This could be the difference between these two classes of agents, but in general, we don't really know what's going on there with, uh, uh, with certainty. Uh, <clears throat> What we know from animal studies is that uh, 
there is a super sensitivity of dopamine receptors after a prolonged exposure to antipsychotics. So this uh, leads to a number of worrying assumptions. For example, what will happen if we abruptly stop antipsychotics? Already since the late 60s and the early 70s, there were some studies suggesting that when you discontinue antipsychotics, a full-blown psychosis appear. And still it survives some kind of uh, uh, malignant psychosis syndrome after close-up in discontinuation. Uh, these are probably biased, uh, biased opinions. What we do know is that uh, from, uh, uh, let me, let me find the, what we know from uh, trials is that when you discontinue antipsychotics, you have a gradual worsening, not an acute worsening. Now, if you withdraw a, uh, withdraw a drug and you have a rebound phenomenon, this is abrupt. What we see in trials is that it is gradual. So this is against a supersensitivity, psychotic, or a tardive rebound psychosis. And this is supported by uh, meta-analysis, especially by the meta-analysis by Steven Leucht and T. Honen. Um, you see how the abrupt and the tapered uh, way of discontinue do not cause any uh, rebound psychosis. Both uh, cause uh, a relapse because treatment in general has stopped. So the patient is not protected anymore and gradually it falls back into psychosis, but it does not make a rebound uh, thing. Uh, there is no effect, as I said, no effect of antipsychotic withdrawal on the relapse rate. And this is uh, the locked data. Uh, which suggests that this is true for all antipsychotics, depots, and etc. Every uh, it's uh, they are equal in these terms. Now, what does what what all these data suggest if we uh, combine them? Although in animals, when you give an antipsychotic for prolonged periods of time, you see. Uh, a super sensitivity uh, of dopamine receptors. This probably happens also in humans, but in humans, when you remove the uh, antipsychotic, you do not see a rebound of psychosis. Is this an oxymoron? Because we, we were all trained with the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia in our minds and in our teaching material. The issue is that dopamine probably is not at the core of the pathophysiology of schizophrenia. It's a pathway, an indirect pathway to treat psychosis. The same way that diuretics uh, are used to treat congestive heart failure. They do not have any effect on the heart muscle itself, but they, they relieve the heart by uh, reducing the volume. So probably this is the way antipsychotics work in schizophrenia. They do not, and in psychosis, they do not work on the uh, core pathophysiology of schizophrenia, but instead they work through uh, indirect side pathways to relieve symptoms in the patient. And this is why when you uh, withdraw an agent, no uh, relapse psychosis emerges. Now, the next question is, does initial treatment with antipsychotics worsen the long-term outcome? Okay, we, we, we know that for the short term, everything is fine and uh, solid, solidly proven, but what happens in the long term? Because there are, in, in medicine, there are specific treatments that would, might, might worsen the, the long-term outcome. What happens with antipsychotics? Now, um, there are uh, some, uh, uh, let, uh, some, some papers, especially again with Moncrief, that says the same thing. But um, 
there are nine, nine relevant publications which follow patients for uh, a long period of time. Uh, you can see them here. Some of them are old, some since the, the 60s and the 70s, some are uh, most recent. Uh, and they do not seem to provide any evidence for such uh, a worsening in the long term. What they say is that uh, uh, historical data suggest that before the introduction of antipsychotics, up to 30% of patients had uh, uh, a remission of their initial episode with 15% uh, a sustained remission over time, and this was increased by uh, the use of antipsychotics. So the, the medium and long-term outcome has been improved with the use of antipsychotics. Uh, the question that arises then is whether the maintenance treatment worsens, the, the, the even longer-term outcome in terms of many years. Now, in terms of many years, uh, there is a meta-analysis of uh, 65 trials for maintenance up to one year. And it is, it is completely uh, proven that uh, it is superior to placebo with relapse rate is uh, uh, almost half of that of placebo. And uh, in terms of uh, relapse, of uh, hospitalization, much more difference concerning aggressive evaluant behavior and even dropouts are better, uh, but it's, it's suboptimal. There is no difference in employment, deaths or dropouts. Um, and of course, the medication arm um, caused much more side effects. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, this uh, beneficial effect of medication was unrelated to a number of things that we consider to be important, like illness duration or duration of previous periods. It seemed that the uh, antipsychotic treatment uh, exerted a more or less independent effect, independent of uh, the uh, most easily uh, assessed uh, characteristics of the illness and up to three years this has been proven although there is a huge discontinuation rate of course uh, but still but still when you go on to aggressively lower or discontinue antipsychotic treatment you get double relapse rate within the first one and a half year. So definitely, again, for the first three years, these are the studies, for the first three years, we do have uh, a beneficial effect. But what happens with prolonged uh, follow-up, 10 years, 20 years? Now, uh, the problem with these prolonged studies is that they are poorly controlled because you cannot really keep a patient under placebo or very strict conditions for sub, such prolonged periods of time. It's, it's neither practical nor ethical. So we mainly have um, low to moderate quality of uh, trials. Now, the small observational studies suggest that patients off antipsychotics have a more favorable outcome. Results of intermediate size studies are mixed and epidemiological uh, level studies based on registry and the more, the, and the more reliable uh, set of, uh, uh, of data suggest that uh, continuous maintenance treatment is beneficial. So from small, from small to big from unreliable bias to more reliable and objective studies, we have uh, a continuum towards a beneficial uh, effect of antipsychotics in the long term, which is probably the case. 
the pivotal study here is the Wunderich study. The Wunderich study is the flagship of those suggesting that antipsychotics do not work in the in the long term. Uh, before I go to the Wunderich study, I want to, uh, to point out here that there were some uh, data uh, from uh, a paper uh, hosted by the World Health Organization uh, and suggested that in some uh, uh, lesser developed countries, schizophrenia had a better outcome. Now, this is still discussed and still taught, but it has been uh, shut down because uh, newer studies and uh, reanalysis of the same patient data and follow-up of the same patient suggest that this was an er erroneous result. Schizophrenia does not, schizophrenia patients do not do better in less developed countries. They do the same across the world. Uh, now, uh, there are a number of projects around the world, like the ESOP, like the Chicago follow-up studies that tried to taper down and uh, discontinue treatment. They, sometimes they, they publish some data of very, very low quality and they suffer from the bias I showed you in my first slide, this kind of. This, this kind of bias. You have a large placebo uh, component in both arms and some patients do well without medication and these patients tend to stay in these trials. So uh, these are small, very in very selective samples and uh, when they do uh, published data, uh, they are unreliable and should not be taken into consideration, uh, really. Give me a minute to find. Now, this is the Soteria project, for example. The Soteria project is one such project, and eventually it, um, it was proven that only half of patients were really suffering from schizophrenia. So they have a number of biases in, in, inherent in their uh, design. Uh, as said, the flagship of these opinions is the Wunderich 2013 study. Uh, this was uh, uh, seven, eight years follow-up, and it suggested that there is no difference in the relapse rate uh, no difference in the symptomatic remission in those patients who discontinued those versus those who continued treatment. Uh, but the number of relapses were too low. Why was too low? Because most of the patients did not suffer from schizophrenia. So this is not a reliable study. Uh, no difference in the amount of uh, zero intake of antipsychotics although both, uh, there, there, is, there was a difference between these two arms. The, in the one arm, there were almost, uh, agents were almost discontinued, while in the other arm, uh, treatment was uh, uh, sustained. Uh, there was no difference in the month with zero intake, which means, uh, to, to cut a, a long uh, story short, that these are naturalistic studies with multiple biases and these multiple biases interplex and eventually what you come up with uh, a conclusion is not a real and reliable conclusion. Uh, this study is, uh, is marketed as a discontinuation study but in fact it's a lowering dosage trial, not a discontinuation study. Half of the patient did not have schizophrenia and all, although it, it, it started as a randomized, a randomized study, after 18 months it, is, it, it opened. So it allowed the fusion and the exchange of patients between arms. So there is nothing to learn from this study. Uh, 
let's go to the next uh, question. Does the relapse rate levels after three years irrespective of treatment? Well, there are no data to support this. It's, uh, it's an assumption that largely comes again from the Wunderich study. Um, we don't know if uh, relapses do level. What we know is that patients uh, shift towards a chronicity, which means, okay, you do not see relapses, maybe, but what you see is a sustained loss of uh, functioning. So it doesn't matter whether your patient relapses or not, that we don't really know, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that patients become chronic after some time. Uh, is longer duration of antritic psychosis a negative predictor of the outcome, the DUP? duration of antritic psychosis that we, we, we used to say that if, if you delay in the treatment of psychosis, then you, there is a deficit that accumulates and makes treatment even worse. So if you give antipsychotics early in the course of treatment, then you have a better overall outcome and they exert a prophylactic effect. Is that so? Well, um, it seems that uh, Duration of antritic psychosis is modestly related to positive and negative symptoms, mostly to positive, which means that the earliest you start treatment, the better the outcome you get. Uh, and uh, this is also one of the uh, uh, outcomes of the Wunderich study, suggested that Duration of atrial psychosis was, in essence, the only variable significantly related to remission. This is one of the outcomes of this particular study that, 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 that the, its authors say do not prescribe antipsychotics. In essence, it says do prescribe antipsychotics. Here it is. Here it is. Um, now, the problem here is that the, uh, the development of chronicity in schizophrenia is unpredictable. In some patients, it takes years. In other patients, it, it makes jumps. So, on average, uh, it depends on your population sample, on your study sample to see. This is why uh, the outcome is generally a modest correlation between duration of atrial psychosis and um, outcome. Uh, also, because almost half of patients who do not respond do not respond already since their first episode. So we do have uh, a floor effect since the beginning. Uh, this is one of the uh, multinational efforts we did uh, in, in collaboration with uh, many of you. Uh, Daria had a, a pivotal role in this and it suggests that uh, jumping through the stages from stage one to stage two to three in schizophrenia as we defined these stages takes decades not months or years. So even even a trial that spreads over eight years uh, might not be able to catch uh, progression from stage to stage. Uh, schizophrenia seems to uh, relate to life stages and life milestone of development. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to arrive at conclusions with uh, observations lasting for a few months or uh, a couple of years. This is why the duration of atrial psychosis and other indices we consider to be important show only modest effect because the, the span, the time span we observe them is very, very small. You cannot see a difference when you go from this point to this. It's very difficult and it spans over 10 years maybe. This is the refined model, you have positive symptoms in the beginning, the other symptoms are rather low, then you have excitement and hostility during the second phase, 
the second stage of schizophrenia. You have depression uh, during the third and cognitive decline during, uh, during the, the last stage of schizophrenia. And the question is whether uh, you need different treatment options. Definitely antipsychotics do work here uh, and probably until this uh, stage we don't know what happens later and here probably we have also vas vascular decline and other organic uh, age related factors probably we need some kind of antidepressants during uh, the third stage so it's not a, a unimodal way of treating these patients now in combination with the duration of a treated psychosis comes another question are relapses toxic so uh, to, to 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 definitely answer the uh, previous question yes duration of adrenaline psychosis is toxic probably in to a moderate uh, degree now are relapses toxic uh, there is the so called kindling model that the kindling model as a concept comes from uh, neurology and epilepsy. Uh, if you have a patient that uh, underwent uh, epileptic fits again and again, then it, uh, the threshold for fits uh, is lowering and it's, it's, it's always more easy to trigger epileptic, effect, epileptic uh, seizures again and again, so uh, the condition deteriorates. Uh, it seems that during the first episodes we have a better outcome with lower dosages and slowly refractories accumulates at the rate of 16% for each subsequent episode, but with 40% already being refractory during the first episode. So after four or five or six episodes, the majority of patients are refractory. And this is why we need to start uh, treatment earlier before deficit accumulates on the patient. Now, of course, deterioration has begun already before the first episode, but it tends to accumulate rapidly, especially during the early years. Now, this is a key issue. What happens here is that you have a patient at his first episode, and the first episode is more or less benign. And doctors tend to discontinue medication during these early years that the patient is responsive to treatment, they expose him to more relapses. And as deterioration accumulates rapidly during these first years, what we do with suboptimal treatment during these early years is that we wait to see what's going to happen and it happens. And when we see what has happened, it's too late. So it's, it's a vicious cycle, like a self-fulfilling property a pro prophecy. Um, relapses do correlate with a worse long-term outcome, and it's better to prescribe treatment during the first few years as said. Now, okay, until now we established that Antipsychotics do work during the uh, early phases. During the first episode, you need continuous treatment for several years. Uh, you don't have any reason to discontinue them. The outcome is better when you have continuous treatment. How about side effects? What's the issue of brain volume due to antipsychotics? The first question to answer is, is there brain volume loss? in patients with schizophrenia. Because if there is, we need to, to differentiate the part that belongs to the antipsychotic use. If there is not, then any loss should be attributed to antipsychotics. If there is a huge brain loss in schizophrenia and it's less in, under antipsychotics, then antipsychotics are a protective factor. So we need to establish first what happens with schizophrenia in general as a disease. Now, what we know is that, Daria, how, how long do I have? Okay. 
uh, what we have is that uh, I'm, the... I'm sorry, Costas. Uh, I just uh, uh, you have your time because we can't reach Alan. Uh, we can't reach. Okay. Uh, via Facebook and via his secretary as well. So he gave us uh, permission. Everything. I sent the email and uh, I'm trying to call him via Facebook. So no answer as well. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but so you you managed. Uh, Alan. Time. Alan. Alan replied. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alan replied that uh, he is uh, online now. Can you check? Because I am oh, in full god, screen. Oh my god, this is amazing. So afterwards he will... Amazing. Oh my god, yes. Thank you. Thank Just you. give me one minute. I will uh, stop sharing my screen uh, to see if Alan is indeed online. Alan, Alan, yes. Alan. Okay. I don't know, Alan, just Alan, not young, but... Yes, yes, I, I will yeah, find. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, thank Hello. you. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? Hi, okay. my, my apologies for being no late. Problem. I had it down for the wrong time, but I'm no. ready to go whenever you want. So. No problem, let me, finish my, yeah. let me finish my speech and then you will uh, take over, okay? Yes, I ask, please. So, um, what we were uh, saying is that we need to define first whether there are brain changes in schizophrenia. Uh, there are volume changes. Uh, to cut a, a long story short, uh, there are volume changes in schizophrenia, but they are largely uh, because of neuropil uh, changes. Now, neuropil is uh, the volume because of the size of the neurons and the number of synapses and the volume and size of these synapses. So what happens in schizophrenia is that neurons become smaller and uh, you have fewer synapses, uh, which means that you have a, a smaller volume of uh, uh, gray uh, matter, but uh, has not been proven that uh, there is a loss of uh, number of neuron cells, death of neurons. This has not been proven, at least has not been proven solidly. Uh, there are some 3D histopathological studies. Now, 3D studies are more reliable in comparison to two-dimensional studies and suggest some loss, some reduction in numbers, especially in the temporal lobe. But this is not solidly proven. So what we know is that we do not have uh, a widespread neuron death in schizophrenia, neuron loss in schizophrenia. So the question here is what happens with uh, antipsychotic treatment? Uh, now, Again, let's go to a paper that suggests here, it's from Zipruski and Robin Murray, uh, that MRI studies suggest that there is a brain loss and this brain loss is because of antipsychotic medication. Uh, and cognitive functioning does not appear to deteriorate over time. And so any, any deterioration, any progress in the deterioration should be attributed to antipsychotics. Um, I am very sad to expose colleagues, but this is out of proportion for what Moncrief suggests here. You can see that it, he, she says that uh, uh, the paper they cite is a post. This is a, a comment on the Goff et al. paper. Goff wrote a paper like the one we wrote for the CIMP WPA. And in that paper, Goff cited a post mortem study published in 1985. And Moncrief says that uh, this study is predated. And uh, the second thing is that there are only no proper controls to differentiate between the brains of people with schizophrenia and brains of people without. But let's take the first study. It says that since it was published in 85, all these people were taking antipsychotics. So it cannot be proven 
that uh, antipsychotic naive patients have brain loss in, in, in terms of the data of this paper. But in that specific, specific paper, it says explicitly that the brains were collected between 80, 28 and 53, that is before the introduction of neuroleptic treatment. I want to show you with this example that you need to dig, dig deep when you read a paper. You cannot take the words of other people at face value as they are reliable. For this particular uh, example, they were not. Anyway, um, let's speed up. Let's speed up. So uh, the uh, issue here is one uh, uh, one meta-analysis by uh, Vita. One minute. Sorry, I lost it. Okay, this is this is the Vita uh, meta-analysis. Uh, the Vita meta-analysis uh, meta-analyzed uh, all uh, uh, studies that, that uh, concern the use of antipsychotics and brain volume in schizophrenia. However, all of them were open studies. The only three studies which are randomized and controlled are the Garver, the Lieberman, and the crespo Facoro. Uh, these are the only studies you can use to see if there is any change in brain volume because of antipsychotic treatment. And Vita suggests that there is a difference between first and second generation antipsychotics, with first generation of the antipsychotics producing an, a, a, a brain atrophy in patients, while second generation do not produce such an atrophy. But the problem is a methodological problem. Uh, when you have three studies, you do not, three arms, you do not uh, uh, compare A to C and B to C and then drive uh, conclusions because A differs from C, but B does not differ from the, does not differ from C. So you conclude that A differs from B. What you do is you need to analyze all three groups together. And when you analyze all three groups together, what you see here is that confidence intervals overlap. The uh, the, the, the the real uh, conclusions from the Vita 2015 study is that atypical antipsychotics typical antipsychotics and placebo patients do not differ from each other in terms of uh, brain volume. So we have answered all these questions. Uh, I will uh, uh, stop here to uh, uh, answer some questions if there are and then proceed with uh, the speech of Alan. Daria, do we have questions? Uh, sorry. Yes, we have questions. Dear Costas, thank you very much for your amazing lecture. And there is uh, Timur Senekov, who is very prominent psychiatrist uh, from Moscow, Russia. And he asks you the question, if uh, the study revealed that only half of schizophrenic patients had schizophrenia for sure, then how you can trust other studies? This is the question. You cannot trust any study in the way you say it. But, uh, in this, in this particular uh, study, they they they, they uh, specifically mention it that uh, less than uh, half of their patients were uh, suffering from schizophrenia, and the patients in general suffer from some kind of psychosis of schizophrenia spectrum diseases. So spectrum. you need to you need to 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 read very carefully the materials and methods of each study and specifically the population, the composition of the population. Otherwise, you will extrapolate from uh, what you see in a brief episode, brief psychotic episode, you, you extrapolate to schizophrenia and then you extrapolate that uh, since a brief episode is has a, benefit, uh, a benign course, then schizophrenia also has a benign course, which is not 
the case, but in every study should be judged by itself uh, after a very, very careful uh, reading and examination of it uh, on, on a basis of, uh, uh, of every detail it has. Yes. Other, uh, other question? Um, and uh, your presentation was full of information and everybody wants to reread all the slides again <laughs> because, uh, yes, yeah, so that's... Uh, well, the paper will be out uh, very yeah. soon, so you will have the, uh, the chance to read it in a more structured way and uh, by taking your time. So, thank you very maybe, much. Maybe Afzal has a, a comment yeah. to do because it was, a, it was a joint, I think it was the first joint endeavor between the CIMP and the WPA. You are absolutely right, uh, uh, Kostros. This is the first initiative and uh, this is actually a part of the action plan for the next triennium that WPA is going to collaborate and coordinate their activities with other professional organizations. And thanks for leading this project. And uh, once it is published, then obviously we will try to put the link on the website, on WPA's website as well. I, 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 I recommend that uh, this is uh, going to be one of the initial and one of the foremost uh, activities that will set future scenes in this era of collaboration. Do we have any other questions, Daria? And we hope we hope that we will involve Alan in a similar activity at some stage. <laughs> or bipolar. Yes. <laughs> we are we are struggling with Alan and others now for geriatric bipolar uh, disorder. Yeah. And it's a mess really. <laughs> So just, are there, yes, are there any uh, just other? Mo mostly about bipolar disorder, continue asking about if the role of melatonin in bipolar. You will, help you will reserve problems. You will reserve all bipolar questions for Alan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, any, anything specific on the, and, uh, on, on the specific topic of the. Um, just, just this cost us. Thank you so much. Only this, okay. Uh, Oleg, Peter, shall do we proceed for Alan? Uh, uh, if you permit me, Costa, probably uh, I, I have one question to you. Yes. Just, just very simple because you touch uh, the I IPSS study, International Pilot Study of Schizophrenia Follow-up. And you, you mentioned that there are some data which have some doubts about the, uh, the difference in the outcome in schizophrenia between the uh, um, so-called developing country and how it was mentioned that time because it was separation developed and developing country at that time. Well, uh, how you could uh, you could comment who is who who make this study and who makes such conclusion? Because if I remember correctly, this observation has been made. Uh, even by Emil Kreplin when he started to investigate transcultural psychiatry. Uh, what, what has been changed after this 100 more, 120 years? Uh, you will give me a couple of minutes to find the, uh, to find the original text because this is, uh, these are some details I cannot remember by, um, uh, by heart, but, uh, uh, in in fact, in fact, there are a number of uh, uh, a number of studies from uh, developing countries as well as follow up from um, follow up from the same from the same uh, patients uh, yeah. that do not suggest a, a beneficial effect. Just, just a minute. Give me a minute. No, I think it could. If I remember correctly, the the developing country was Nigeria. I think it was a group in Ibadan, and I think it was two groups in India. 
so that it could from be... India from India the uh, the follow-up was negative yeah from yeah. India and some data from China do not support uh, from from impoverished uh, counties of China do not support uh, such a beneficial effect for patients who are living in conditions uh, not not modern conditions I think it was uh, Taiwan, I think, uh, as a collaborating center, some center in Taiwan, if I remember correctly, because it was about 40 years ago. Give me a minute, I cannot find, that's, that's, that's peculiar, okay. I cannot okay. find the, the text, and without the text I cannot uh, really uh, say the, the very specific. I, I will um, ask Kassan Jablonski and I will ask Norman Sartorius, they know I think better about it. One One minute, I think I found it. Okay. So, um, we are talking about the, uh, the WHO 1979 study. Yes. The Schizophrenia and International Follow-up Study. That's, that's a book uh, published by uh, LEF in 1992. Left Sartorius, Jablensi, Court, and Emberg, the International Pilot Study of Schizophrenia, five year follow up findings in psychological medicine, and also uh, by Harrison, Copper, Greg, Laska, Janka, Jablensky, etc. Uh, recovery from psychotic illness, 15 and 25 year international follow up study, British Journal of Psychiatry in uh, 2001. Um, now, um, uh, what uh, uh, has been published afterwards that was a, pa a paper by Cohen uh, in 2008, Question in an Axiom, Better Prognosis for Schizophrenia in the Developing World, Schizophrenia Bulletin, that reanalyzed this data. Karajanis et al., 2009, uh, Worldwide Schizophrenia Outpatient Health Outcomes, W. Soho, the Soho study, baseline characteristics of pan-regional observation data from more than 17,000 patients. Uh, the Kolhara, 2009, that's the, and the Padma, 2014, these are Indian data. Uh, these are the studies that uh, look again at the original data and also included uh, some data from, uh, uh, from, uh, from newer cohorts and suggest that there's no really uh, a better outcome, but okay, we can discuss this. Yeah, yeah, because I have an impression that it was based on the original uh, original data only. So okay, that's it. Uh, Carol, welcome. Dear Costas, uh, one more question may I ask. Yes. Uh, from Timur Senikov from Moscow again. Uh, he asked, "What about dosing?" What is more beneficial, fixed or f flexible regarding schizophrenia? What is your uh, opinion? Carol, I gave you the option to unmute your microphone if you like. Uh, now, uh, flexible dosage, of course, it's always flexible do dosage better because you, you can adjust to the needs of the patient, of the individual patient, and you need to uh, adjust in terms of uh, also of side effects uh, and also of uh, efficacy. You cannot go with fixed dosages except for, except for uh, some uh, agents who have very, a very narrow dosage range and very specific uh, pills like uh, aripiprazole. You can give maybe 15 or 13, not, not really not really many choices, but for example, with risperidon, you can go from one to 12, or with, uh, with quetiapine, you can give whatever you like, and depends. So flexible dosage is always the way to, uh, to treat the individual patient. Now, in, in terms of trials, flexible dosages, flexible dosage uh, trials are usually negative, simply because most uh, arms 
are uh, suboptimal. And uh, those who are optimal, they have, uh, because they are not flexible, they have too many dropout uh, patients. So. Very interesting. Thank you for this commentary. But let's go to Alan. Yes. Peter. Yeah. Will you introduce or Oleg? Who's going to introduce Alan? Well, Oleg disappears, so that I, I think I will. He's here, but I need to unmute him. Well, so, I... for some reason, when you, uh, when I... you mute your microphone. Thank you, thank you, Peter. I am not disappearing. I'm here. I'm, I'm also <laughs> awaiting for Alan, and uh, let me introduce him. Uh, our our next speaker is Professor Alan Young. He's from London. He is a professor and the director of the Center for Affective Disorders in the Department of Psychological Medicine in the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Professor Young is the head of academic psychiatry in this institute and the clinical academic lead in the psychological medicine and integrated care clinical academic group in the South London and Mosley. Uh, and mostly trust, where he is also a consultant psychiatrist and the head of National Affective Disorder at Shelley Clinic. Professor Young's research interests focus on the cause and treatments for severe psychiatric illnesses, particularly mood disorders. And today his presentation is going to be about treatment of rapid cycling bipolar disorders. Please, Professor Young. We need to unmute his microphone. So, okay. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. You can hear me? Yeah. So, thank you very much. You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. And my profuse apologies for almost giving Daria a panic attack and uh, apologies to Costas and everyone. I'm afraid what happened is it went into my uh, diary for the wrong uh, time. So it went in at uh, local time, not UK time. And it's a great pleasure to, to join you all. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Good, excellent. Thank you, you very can, much. You, you can, okay. So um, I will um, advance my slides. So my talk today is about the treatment of bipolar disorder, and I'm going to talk about this in general and then move to talk about rice, uh, rapid cycling. And um, the illustration here is from a theme park in, in Vancouver, where I used to live. I, I worked there for six years. Uh, and this is a roller coaster ride, which I think actually is quite a good illustration of the course of bipolar disorder that some people uh, can have. So just to give you my disclosures, and thank you to Oleg for, um, for uh, his kind introduction. Uh, for pointing out that I am a past president of the International Society for Affective Disorders, uh, which hosts usually the WPA section uh, on affective disorders and therefore it's a great pleasure to take part in a WPA meeting uh, and it's a particular pleasure to take part in one with colleagues uh, including those that I've mentioned and Afsal, our, our new president. So thank you again. So moving on to talk about what is bipolar disorder, um, I'm going to start with things you already know but then go through to some of the more um, uh, esoteric uh, data. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, Kostas's very expert lecture, and I think he's absolutely right that you have to dig into the detail of papers. Uh, and we actually are living in a news, in an era of almost sometimes fake news with science, where people are reporting what they want from papers rather than what they actually show. So what is bipolar disorder? Well, it is a recurrence. As Kreplin said, the feature that's most important is it's a recurrent affective or mood disorder, which typically involves both mania and depression. Now, bipolar one is manic or mixed episodes and almost always episodic depressions. Um, 
I was interested in the recent talk and the conversations about different uh, outcomes in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and India for schizophrenia. Uh, there's a parallel literature with bipolar disorder where there appears to be more unipolar mania in sub-Saharan Africa and possibly in the Caribbean. Uh, and this is interesting. Unipolar mania is defined as only manic attacks, no depression, uh, occurring over the course of decades. We've recently looked at the data for England and France, uh, our data in England and French data with Bruno Etan and colleagues, and we do find unipolar mania in these two countries, but it's much rarer. It's, a, it's really only about 1% or so, perhaps a little more of bipolar 1. Why is it more uh, prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world? Well, it may be genetic differences, but it also may be that these unipolar manias are not bipolar disorder, but are rather phenocopies. Uh, and that may be something that's true for schizophrenia as well, that you have something which is syndromally the same, but has a different cause. Nevertheless, unipolar mania does occur uh, in, 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 in Europe. And that's very interesting scientifically. Bipolar 2 is recurrent depression with uh, major depressions with hypomanic episodes. This is a source of real uh, clinical challenge, uh, mainly because hypomania is a transient state. It's not particularly severe. Uh, and people tend to think it's major depressive disorder. And uh, hypomania may not be a may not be a particularly severe clinical condition, but it is a marker of a different mood disorder, and it's a marker that this is not major depressive disorder. And lastly, subsyndromal states, and I'll talk about these in a moment or two when I come to talk about the epidemiology. But essentially, these are depression with even lesser degrees of hypomania that don't amount to syndromal hypomania or vice versa, hypomania with lesser degrees of depression. Now there's two other points which I want to flag up at the beginning, two other important concepts. Rapid cycling bipolar disorder, this is at least four episodes or four clear switches in polarity in a year. Remember, part of the definition of an episode is a duration criteria. So for example, a week for mania. But I have seen patients, and many of you will have seen patients who can be fully manic one day and then fully depressed the next and then manic again. So these are switches in polarity rather than uh, episodes which satisfy the duration criteria. Uh, rapid cycling has an interesting history and I'll come on to it in the second half of my lecture. But suffice to say at the moment that it's one of the biggest clinical challenges for psychiatrists treating bipolar disorder. And lastly, mixed states. Mixed states are something that was well recognized by Kreppelin and others. Um, DSM-3 and DSM-4 were rather uh, unhelpful for mixed states. So, for example, in DSM-4, you had to have full syndromal criteria for mania and depression for a week to, to have a mixed state or vice versa. Uh, and this meant that many people with mania, say, who had lesser degrees of depression, uh, were not captured. DSM-5, with the mixed feature specifier, is much more helpful clinically. And I think that's been a real beneficial change in the diagnostic criteria. So this slide builds up, and it's from Kathleen Merikangas, who's a friend of mine in Washington, who's very famous and well known to all of you. Uh, her epidemiological study in the United States which was published in archives in 2007. And you can see that, um, and I'll show data from this um, study again, that in the 12 month period, almost 70% of patients with bipolar 2 and almost 75% of patients with bipolar 1 had a clinically severe mood episode. And the schematic just summarizes that we have mania, uh, we have hypomania, we have subsyndromal 
states, we have mixed states, and we have comorbidities. So all of these are cardinal features of bipolar disorder. So this is some of the data from Mary Kangas's 2007 paper, and there's a follow-up paper in 2011. The key difference between the two is that the 2007 paper was US data only, and the 2011 uh, paper had data from other countries. I'll talk about the US data first. So here's the key findings. It is, bipolar disorder is uh, early onset. It's frequently before 25 years of age. So the, the epoch between 15 and 25 or 30 is the commonest onset. Um, but there are onsets later in life, and I'll show the, the curve for this. Now there's a slight confusion in the literature because there's talk of two or three peaks in onset. So there's clearly a peak early in terms of uh, onset, and then there's perhaps one or two, depending on the study, later peaks. It's a very common disorder. So you can see the lifetime prevalence in the US data is 1% for bipolar 1, 1.1% for bipolar 2, and 24 for the sub-threshold states I described. Now, um, a key question in epidemiology is whether these figures are there internationally. The 2011 paper didn't show similar rates in other countries, but there's a real worry that there was a lack of case detection. So for example, uh, in India, there were no bipolar one cases detected in 2011. So I think it's highly questionable um, as to whether there was actually lower incidences. And I think the standard thinking that bipolar disorder is common everywhere is probably still our best uh, guide. In the UK, for example, we have a large um, a national mental health survey. Bipolar disorder wasn't included until recently. And when it was included, it was found that the uh, prevalence, the lifetime risk was about 2%. So that's for bipolar one and bipolar two. It didn't capture subsyndromal states. So again, that would agree with Mary Kangas's data. The mood episodes are severe. I talked about that in the previous slide. So um, about 70%, 68.8% with bipolar two and about 75% of patients with bipolar 1 have clinically severe episodes. 75% of patients with bipolar disorder have psychiatric comorbidity. Now, this is very important to know. Comorbidity is the rule in bipolar disorder rather than the exception. Some of these comorbidities, such as substance misuse and alcohol misuse, are a reason for people being excluded from clinical trials. So myself and colleagues at uh, the Maudsley have recently published a meta-analysis of clinical trials in people with bipolar disorder and alcohol problems. And the outcomes are a lot poorer than in groups who do not have both bipolar disorder and alcohol, but only have the bipolar disorder. In actual fact, there's only a signal for anti-manic treatments. And manic symptoms are very often associated with substance misuse during episodes, and depression, of course, is a big cause of functional impairment. Now, this is the age of onset curve from Mary Kangas's data, and this is for the first mood episode. So you can see, first of all, that uh, before puberty, there really isn't uh, a signal of mood episodes. This increases during the epoch, uh, the second decade of life, uh, but there is a constant rise thereafter. And there's even new cases onsetting after the age of 50. So it's worthwhile thinking about both of these extremes. At this early stage, there was a, um, a fashion over the past 20 years or so, driven, I think, by academic centers in the United States, Harvard and Pittsburgh, 
to say that there was childhood bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder, which was the same as the adult version, which was evident sometimes even in the first three or four years of life. Now, this was a source of great controversy. If we go back to Kraepelin, Kraepelin did admit the possibility of childhood mania, but said it was extremely rare. And of course, people like Biedemann and Bermaheim and so were reporting a large number of cases. Uh, if you look at high-risk studies, such as the Canadian and the Dutch study, so these are family studies of children, of parents who have bipolar disorder. So the risks are very, very high. Um, mania isn't really reported uh, in these children before the age of 15. Uh, of course, you can get preceding depressive episodes, as you can see from this graph here. So this controversy was there in the literature. It was resolved to some extent in DSM-5 by the introduction of a new category for these children, disruptive mood uh, dysregulation disorder. Uh, studies which have been done since this category was introduced in 2013 have shown that these children, uh, of course, do have a clinical syndrome, but they don't have an increase prevalence of bipolar disorder in their relatives and don't appear to develop adult bipolar disorder. So it appears to be a separate thing. If we go to the other uh, end of the age distribution spectrum, you can see there are some cases on setting after the age of 50. Costa and I are involved in this uh, initiative to try and have treatment guidelines for uh, bipolar disorder in older age adults. I have seen de novo, first time mania with no preceding depression in someone age 67, who we investigated very thoroughly and we found no underlying brain pathology uh, or any uh, suggestion that this could be secondary to something. So it does occur. However, if it's a first mood episode with no preceding depression, after the age of 50, so the first manic episode after the age of 50 with no preceding depression, uh, I think the clinician should look very carefully for any underlying organic cause, MRI scans, a full organic workup should be done. This is what we did with our 67 year old. Uh, we didn't find anything. And uh, we followed him up for about five or six years. He had a second attack of mania, he recovered fully. Uh, and as far as follow up went, he didn't develop any dementing process or anything else. So I think you do get these cases, the later onsets, but they're, again, really quite rare. We did a study uh, of an English region when I worked in the north of England in Newcastle, uh, and we looked at the family history of people who had an older onset of bipolar disorder. So this is onset after the age of 50, and we found they had a much lesser family history of bipolar disorder. Again, suggesting that this is a variant of bipolar disorder with perhaps less of the genes of bipolar disorder involved. In terms of what Costas and I are thinking about with uh, the older age of treatment, now there's remarkably little in the way of clinical trials about older age people with bipolar disorder. There is a bit of a paradox because many of the people with bipolar disorder who survive into their 70s and 80s, and I have people like this in my clinic, are very healthy survivors. So bipolar disorder, as you know, has a high rate of uh, cardiovascular and diabetes and all, all of the common killers, and there's an increased death rate. But the people who get through that who in my view are typically uh, bipolar one lithium responders, can actually be remarkably healthy in later life. And that's one of the things that we'll be discussing when we look at the treatment guidelines. The other thing to say about the onset between the age of 10 and 25 is that this is the age when many disorders onset. And you can see from this graph from Jacobi here that anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, substance misuse. This is a period when many of the disorders that we uh, treat 
in uh, adult psychiatry onset, and it can take a while to separate out, especially for bipolar disorder, because this typically presents with two episodes of depression before any sign of mania or hypomania. So even the best uh, psychiatrists will get it wrong. And I think the, the appropriate way is to say that psychiatric diagnoses in this era, this era of life, are provisional. So my guide is that a diagnosis of major depressive disorder is always a provisional diagnosis because it can always turn into bipolar disorder with an episode of hypomania or mania. Uh, it can't go the other way. So bipolar disorder doesn't go back to being major depressive disorder. And you can see in this graph, which is derived from some of the work of Michael Burke and others, some of the complexities of the diagnosis. So you can see that typically, um, and there will be exceptions to this, but typically the individual will show some signs of mental illness in their teens, mood swings, then an episode of depression, and then some symptoms of mania, then a full episode of mania, and then the delay in diagnosis can be up to 10 years. Now this is improving in many localities, but in some countries, first episode mania is still lumped in with first episode schizophrenia and essentially treated as if it was schizophrenia. Uh, another complexity is that in two thirds of cases, the initial presentation is typically depression. This symptom overlap leads to misdiagnosis. So about one third of patients are misdiagnosed and also comorbidities. Now, I must emphasize this. Mary Kangas' paper showed that 75% of people with bipolar disorder have a psychiatric comorbidity. This is almost everything else in DSM is comorbid with bipolar disorder, but particularly alcohol, substance misuse, uh, and anxiety symptoms, as well as ADHD. So it's difficult to think of something that isn't comorbid with bipolar disorder. Uh, alcohol particularly presents a problem because very often uh, it can be diagnostically difficult to be clear that this is, say, bipolar 2 disorder or an alcohol misuse disorder when the person is actively drinking. So here's the treatment challenges in bipolar disorder. It's often unrecognized or undiagnosed. I think this may differ in different countries. In the UK, uh, it's often uh, unrecognized within the first episode psychosis population or in the treatment resistant depression. Comorbidities are common and can hinder diagnosis, but the predominant phase is depression. Even though we define bipolar disorder by mania or hypomania, if you look longitudinally over patients um, course of disease, it's much more about depressive episodes. Long-term protection is really what we need. We need long-term protection against manic and depressive symptoms. And please remember the subtypes, bipolar one, bipolar two, uh, subsyndromal, rapid cycling and mixed states. So we have some trials in bipolar one, we have far fewer in bipolar two, and vanishingly little in subsyndromal states. Okay, now um, there's been talk about the guidelines uh, and I think um, it's a very welcome development if the WPA is going to bring guidelines together because there's really been a plethora of different guidelines from different countries uh, with different approaches to them. Uh, in the UK, we have the NICE guidelines, which are government inspired. These have not always been helpful to clinicians uh, in the UK. This is our monthly prescribing guidelines that I do with David Taylor and Thomas Barnes. Uh, we do this um, you know, every couple of years and we're revising it just now. So what I say is based on the Maudsley guidelines, but I'm aware there's other very helpful guidelines out there. I think it's important to just remember a few important facts about the requirement for treatment. So all treatment, is a balance between benefits and harms. And of course, we expect the benefits to outweigh the harms. 
Remember that this is based on group data and may not apply to the individual. So there may be an individual for whom there's harmful side effects which outweigh the, uh, the benefits. But this is based on group data and this informs the clinician when they're uh, reading the guidelines which are based on the evidence. And of course, this should be um, further based on accurate diagnosis and identification of all comorbidities. So again, it's a great concern to me in bipolar disorder that we rule people out of trials who have alcohol problems. Uh, I think the answer to this is we need to do specific trials in that population. Uh, I think we should also be quite clear that the methodology for identifying benefits and harms is much better developed in uh, drug studies than in psychotherapy studies or in device studies. So we do, of course, use psychological treatments, we use devices in psychiatry and we use drugs. We sometimes come up against the notion that psychological treatments cannot cause harm. This is obviously not the case. And I think that the methodology that's been developed for systematically looking at benefits and harms in drug studies should be applied to the same level of scrutiny to both psychological treatments and devices. So there we go. That's the, the, the background, the conceptual background to thinking about treatment. The other point about bipolar disorder, Costas knows this very well, is that there are multiple phases of treatment. So there's the acute treatment, which is until clinical response, which is symptomatic remission. This may, for example, last six to 12 weeks. There's then a continuation point, which is defined in Goodwin and Jameson, is from the point of clinical response to the point at which spontaneous recovery might be expected in untreated patients. This addresses the so-called tale of vulnerability uh, after remitted symptoms. So for example, I was called to the ward uh, recently to see someone who was supposed to have their second episode of mania within six weeks. So they'd been admitted, treated for the mania, they'd then been discharged, and two weeks later they'd come back uh, because they'd stopped their medication. Now that isn't a second episode of mania, that's essentially the first episode which has been allowed to return because of lack of compliance with treatment. And then there is the maintenance phase. Now this prevents or attenuates future mood episodes. In a recurrent disorder like bipolar disorder, this is incredibly important. But also these studies are very time consuming, very expensive and very difficult to do. So going through some of these, this is uh, Cipriani's, uh, Andrea Cipriani, who's in Oxford. Uh, his network meta-analysis, this is a technique that's become prevalent in looking at data recently. This allows indirect comparison. So for example, uh, everything here is compared to placebo. Uh, so Ziprazidone is compared to placebo, and so is aripiprazole. Uh, they're not compared directly, but they give you an indirect comparison. Now, this is much less uh, methodologically rigorous than a direct comparison, a trial in which you had ziprazidone, aripiprazole, and placebo. But nevertheless, it gives some indication of relative ranking. Now, I take Costas's previous point about looking at the detail of a paper very carefully. And this is a good illustration of why Costas's uh, point was so important. If you look at the headline for this, you can see acceptability of the drug, which is really a measure of harm, and the ranking of efficacy. And you can see, for example, that all of the drugs here are better for efficacy than placebo, including lamotrigine marginally, although to pyramate and gabapentin are not. And you can see that the, um, the atypical antipsychotics and some of the anticonvulsants are more acceptable than placebo. But you can see, for example, that haloperidol is actually more acceptable than placebo. So I think we have to uh, dig into the paper 
and look at how uh, Cipriani came to these rankings, efficacy was at three weeks. So haloperidol had very good efficacy at three weeks, but we all know that it has a way bigger risk of causing post-mania depression than uh, many of the other treatments. This wasn't captured at all uh, in this uh, study. So I've actually had pharmacists say to me, well, in actual fact, we should just use haloperidol because it's very cheap and you can see it's very acceptable. It's not acceptable. This is a measure at a very early stage in a trial and this is one of the main clinical weaknesses or main clinical adverse effects of haloperidol. Also, um, the, uh, the shortness of the study uh, did tend to mitigate some, uh, against some of these factors. But nevertheless, this is a, a very broad, rough indication. And I think it does show that there's many efficacious and acceptable treatments uh, for mania. The other thing that wasn't captured here was the uh, differential effect of um, uh, treatment on mania with mixed feature specifier, mania with depressive symptoms. And there were some post hoc studies, for example, showing that asenapin was more efficacious in this group than olanzapine in a direct head to head comparison. So I think the point remains, as Costa said, that one should look at the detail in these uh, overall review studies very carefully. But bipolar depression is really what patients and doctors want to see treated more. You can see this is just a summary of this from Roger McIntyre. Uh, the world literature on treating uh, bipolar depression is extremely sparse. And you can see this is a meta-analysis from Edouard Vieta in 2013. And you can see there's very, very few things cross the line. Really, it's only quetiapin here, in the 300 and 600 studies, there's a signal for olanzapine and fluoxetine, uh, but everything else uh, doesn't actually show a positive signal. Now, lamotrigine clearly prevents relapse into depression, but the acute studies failed to show this. And lithium, I think, has now moved up to the point where it's clear that this is antidepressant, at least in preventing relapse. The other new change is we have two new antipsychotics, lurazidone and cariprazine, which have both been licensed in North America for the treatment of bipolar depression. But overall, there's very sparse treatment options. Now, just to briefly talk about psychological treatments, um, we have nice talks about these a lot in the bipolar guidelines, but there's actually very sparse data there's a review by Reiners in 2014, and there haven't really been many studies published since then, which looks at CBT, uh, interpersonal therapy and interpersonal social rhythm therapy, psychoeducation and family interventions. Of these, the one with by far the best data that I think should be recommended for all bipolar patients is psychoeducation. And you can see this very nice study from the Barcelona group, from Colom and Vieta, which looked at the long-term follow-up. Uh, there was a control group. Uh, Colom and Vieta did these studies very rigorously. And you can see there was an enduring beneficial effect. The other uh, one of these techniques, which I think is useful, is uh, the family interventions by David Miklovitz. This is essentially, to my mind, a type of psychoeducational approach done within a family setting for young people who are living with their family. Now, IPT and CBT, I think, do have their uses, but they should be done in a bespoke fashion. They should be used for particular individuals who seem to have factors which suggest they might respond. Okay, so thinking about longer term treatment, and I think uh, I'm going to just say a little bit about this before moving to rapid cycling. Uh, the goals for long, longer term treatment are to prevent new episodes of illness, both syndromal and subsyndromal, to reduce morbidity and mortality, particularly to enhance functioning and quality of life and to prevent suicide, 
There's a nice Danish national cohort study which assessed the risk of suicide after first contact with secondary mental health services in Denmark, and a follow-up about 18 years. The suicide rate in bipolar patients was 8% for men and 5% for women, and it was highest in the group with uh, deliberate self-harm. Of course, Professor Angst in Switzerland has done much longer term follow-up studies and shown that the rates of completed suicide in severe mood disorders, including bipolar disorder, uh, if you follow cohorts of patients up for about 40 years, gets to about 15%. So these are the key questions in maintenance treatment. When should maintenance treatment be considered? How long should maintenance treatment be continued? And what agents should you use? Well, first question, when should maintenance treatment be considered? Uh, can be informed by this nice study from Maurizio Toe. Patients admitted for a first manic or mixed episode, and this is mixed episode in DSM-4 terms, were followed up in an observational way. 19% switched into a new phase of illness within the two years. 40% um, experienced a new episode of illness, 20% mania, 20% depression, and the latency or time to the new episode was about 26 weeks. 57% overall experienced a new illness during the follow-up period, but there were marked differences in recovery depending on the definition. Now, this is a very important point. If you just defined recovery as recovering from the syndrome, they almost all recovered. If you said they weren't allowed to have any subsyndromal symptoms, this dropped to 72%. But if you said people had to be fully functioning as they were before the onset of illness, this was less than half. Now, personally, if I were to have an episode of illness and to recover, I'd want to be fully functioning. So I think that is the target we should be in for. Other studies uh, have studied bipolar disorder in the long term. Many of you will have seen this before. This is a prospective 12-year follow-up of bipolar patients by Lou Judd, who sadly passed away not so long ago. Bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. They were, both groups were uh, symptomatic, only uh, were symptomatic for about half the time, and the predominant symptoms were depression. So you can see two-thirds in bipolar 1 and 94% in bipolar 2. Now, this has also been done in the European and American Stanley Network, and they found very similar results, and that's been published by Ralph Kutka. So depression is the main problem. And again, you can see here, Judd's data looked at in a different way, 12-year follow-up of bipolar 1, any affective disorder episode, 47%, syndromal 11, subsyndromal 30. So what about guidelines? Well, when I started in psychiatry in the 1980s, we talked about starting maintenance treatment of bipolar disorder after three episodes or possibly after two. When we rewrote the BAP guidelines in 2016, we thought that considering the natural history of bipolar disorder and how recurrent it is, that this is really not satisfactory. So we shared really that one should consider long-term treatment. We're not saying you have to do it, but you should consider long-term treatment after a severe single first manic episode. And the NICE guidance is similar, although it's phrased slightly differently. After each episode of mania or depression, you can consider uh, treatment. Okay, so rapid cycling bipolar disorder. Uh, if you just uh, give me a moment, uh, I've got to go and uh, plug in my power cable because my computer is going. So just give me 30 seconds.
Right, sorry about that. I had to go and get a power cable. So rapid cycling bipolar disorder. So after a long preamble, I'm going to talk about this. Rapid cycling bipolar disorder is one in which there's four or more episodes of hypomania or depression occurring in a 12 month period. So here's a little bit about the history of bipolar disorder, rapid cycling. So in 1851, there was a, sorry. In 1851, Folly Circulaire was described by Folry, who lived from 1794 to 1870. And the concept of rapid cycling bipolar disorder has been around for that period of time. But it was not until the 1970s that researchers began to identify this subpopulation. So originally, it was described by Dunner and Fivey, and this was an extremely uh, contentious paper at the time. So Dunner and Fivey, uh, Dunner told me himself that this is a paper that took five years to be accepted. And uh, David Dunner is pictured there. Uh, the reason for describing it as four major depressive manic or hypomanic episodes was because they looked at the occurrence of bipolar disorder and found that this was the um, definition which was associated with the poorer outcome. So moving on to the overall data, 13 to 20% of patients with bipolar disorder will develop rapid cycling during the course of their illness. Now this is greatly overrepresented among patients with bipolar II subtype with a large female 80% of rapid cycling patients predominant. So hyperthyroidism and menstrual cycles have both been suggested as causal factors in the switch to rapid cycling. Rapid cycling, as I say, is markedly overrepresented in bipolar II. Um, and we do see a phenomenon which we would say was rapid cycling pseudo-unipolar. Uh, and uh, I saw a patient in my clinic this week with this. She has two weeks of depression and then two weeks of euthymia and then two weeks of major depression. This is not linked to her menstrual cycle and she's previously had only two episodes of hypomania. So this is a type of challenging clinical scenario that we see with rapid cycling bipolar disorder. Now, the role of antidepressant medication in the induction of mania and cycle acceleration in bipolar disorder is, to my mind, controversial. So there's a retrospective study examining mood fluctuation patterns in patients with an affective disorder hospitalized over three decades. This revealed that rapid mood fluctuations were absent among bipolar patients in 1960, but were evident in 1975 and 85, suggesting an association with pres prescribing practices. And uh, this is uh, a paper by Wolpert et al. But not all studies support this view. So to my mind, the jury's still out in terms of um, the association between rapid cycling and antidepressant use. Malcolm Pete in 94 did a meta-analysis which found that manic switch was less likely to occur with SSRIs than with tricyclic antidepressants. And Yildiz and Sachs in 2003 um, found a significant association between rapid cycling and antidepressant use prior to the first episode of mania for women, but not for men. So I think one of the um, ways in which we might be more informed about antidepressants and uh, rapid cycling is perhaps not to think of antidepressants as being a, a unitary block, as it were, but thinking about them as different classes of antidepressants. And I think it's clear that tricyclic antidepressants and SNRIs are more likely to cause uh, mania and more likely to cause rapid cycling than the other drugs. Patients who experience rapid cycling uh, episodes exhibit increased rates of occurrence and decreased rates of remission and recovery. 
patients with rapid cycling treated with lithium or valproate have an increased risk of recurrence with a history of recent substance misuse, early life abuse, female gender, and a later onset of depression. So rapid cycling used to be thought of as almost uh, an indication for not prescribing lithium, but it now seems to be quite clear that people with rapid cycling have a poorer outcome to all treatments, uh, not particularly lithium. So uh, I don't think uh, the, uh, the old clinical rule of not using lithium in rapid cycling holds anymore. What about rapid cycling and thyroid function? Well, women are disproportionately represented, making up to 80% of rapid cycling patients compared to about 50% of bipolar patients overall. Several studies have found an association amongst, between indices of low thyroid function or clinical hypothyroidism, whilst others refute this association. Now, Michael Bauer, my colleague in Dresden, uh, I think this is when he worked in Los Angeles with Peter Weibrow in 1990, found that 23% of about 30 patients with rapid cycling had grade one hypothyroidism and 27% had grade two and 10% had grade three. So I think uh, when we're thinking about rapid cycling, the first thing is to think about the antidepressants and I'll come on to treatment. And the second thing is to think about thyroid. Uh, so uh, thyroid is an important measure uh, to investigate. Now, we reviewed this recently. This was published at the end of last year. Uh, this is available online. Uh, uh, this looks at uh, studies in thyroid, uh, and we reviewed and commented on this. this Mutahiri Qureshi is one of my trainees. She's originally from Pakistan. She's now a trainee with us at the Maudsley Hospital. This randomized placebo-controlled trial Imagine, uh, examined the relationship between adjunct treatments of supra-physiological uh, thyroxine in refractory mixed effective states of bipolar. Uh, the analysis was divided into between group, so that's uh, whether you've got T4, T3, or placebo, and within groups. The between group analysis showed that the thyroxine group spent a greater time in a euthymic state and less time in a mixed state compared to placebo. So I think this is an interesting paper, which backs up the uh, relatively modest literature about thyroid being important uh, in this area. So what about management of bipolar disorder? Uh, sorry, rapid cycling. So this is uh, covered in the MODSA guidelines. NICE concludes that there's no evidence to support rapid cycling illness being managed any differently from that with a more conventional course. Now, uh, this is one of the problems with NICE in that this is really not helpful to the clinician because it gives no guide at all about what to do with rapid cycling. So while there is no formal first choice agent or combination, prescribing depends partly on the treatments that have already been used in an attempt to prevent or treat mood episodes. In practice, the response to treatment is sometimes idiosyncratic. The individual may show a significant response to one or two drugs, Spontaneous or treatment-related remissions occur in about a third of rapid cyclers, and rapid cycling may come and go. Now, this is an extremely important point. Patients don't stay rapid cycling forever. We've had a number of patients who've been, who've been referred to us for treatment of rapid cycling, and by the time they, they come to see us because of delays in getting their uh, assessment funded, they've had a year without cycling. So it does happen, uh, as I've said here, spontaneously going away in about a third of cases. So what's the suggested treatment? So this is our Maudsley treatments here. So withdraw antidepressants in all patients. And uh, now there's some evidence supporting the continuation of SSRIs, but my own practice is to discuss withdrawing the antidepressants with all patients. Now, this is difficult and contentious because the patient is very often concerned about the depressive episodes. It seems counterintuitive to take away the antidepressant. But my explanation to patients is that although the antidepressant may seem to be helpful in the short term, 
it's actually destabilizing the illness. Then you evaluate possible precipitants. Thyroid, I've talked about, external stressors. Uh, many of these are covered in psychoeducation. Uh, alcohol and uh, substance misuse. Uh, again, this should be covered in uh, general psychoeducation and good clinical care. Then optimize the mood stabilizer treatment using plasma levels. So we use these a lot. My own reference range for lithium is 0.6 to 0.8. I think you've got to optimize valproate, carbamazepine, and lamotrigine to the uh, anticonvulsant uh, uh, reference ranges. Consider combining mood stabilizers. Uh, so lithium plus valproate, lithium plus lamotrigine. The LAM lit study, which was done in the Netherlands, showed a better outcome from lithium and lamotrigine together compared to uh, lithium alone. Uh, and also the, uh, the sequel study done in Oxford by Geddes and colleagues showed that lithium plus Seroquel had good outcomes. And then there's other adjunct treatments that can be given, and they're listed here. Um, aripiprazole, um, Costas mentioned this with schizophrenia. One of the points about aripiprazole is it has a very long half-life and therefore is quite good where there's concerns about compliance. Clozapine is used in bipolar disorder and we've certainly seen this beneficial for some patients with uh, rapid cycling. And it says usual doses here but uh, I'd be interested in what others say, but we often find that 300 milligrams of clozapine uh, is the best level for uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, Lamotrigine, uh, we're guided more by blood levels, and sometimes we go up to 400. So I have a lady who's on uh, 300 at the moment, who's at the bottom of the reference range and can easily go to 400, I think. Uh, the rest of these are mostly... Um, antipsychotics, thyroxine, but I'll mention two in particular, topiramate and nimodipine. Now, topiramate is another anticonvulsant. Those of you who remember the slide of Cipriani's anti-manic treatments will remember that it was one of the two drugs, uh, along with gabapentin, that performed worse than placebo for, preventing, uh, for treating mania. Uh, there was a belief at one point that it was going to be anti-manic on its own, but there are four negative trials done by Janssen that fairly convincingly show that it's not anti-manic. So it is used um, very often in adjunct with atypical antipsychotics to mitigate weight gain, uh, and it's used in some eating disorders, particularly binge eating and bulimia, but I don't favor its use in bipolar. However, nimodipine, which is a calcium channel antagonist, does appear to be useful. Now, there's a very small literature about using this in bipolar disorder. Uh, but we have found it to be a very useful adjunct treatment added in for rapid cycling. We've had half a dozen cases over the last 12 to 18 months of uh, people with rapid cycling bipolar disorder where this has resolved with the addition of nimodipine. We don't seem to get the same effect with other calcium channel antagonists. And of course, remember, nimodipine will be added after we've done all the other steps. So we, it may be finally stabilizing the mood in concert with other treatments. So the choice of drug is determined by patient factors. And there's very little comparable, uh, comparative efficacy data. Quetiapin's got good supporting data, but again, you may for various reasons choose aripiprazole, olanzapine. I've mentioned nimodipine and thyroxine, which I think if you see rapid cycling bipolar disorder, you should be particularly uh, interested in using. So to summarize, rapid cycling bipolar disorder, four or more mood episodes in 12 months or switches in polarity. Um, experienced psychiatrists, of which I'm sure there's many on the call, will have seen some individuals where they have four switches in polarity in a day. But rapid cycling is something that people move into and move out of. It's not necessarily a, 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 a one-way ticket. There's a high level of depressive morbidity and suicide risk. Rapid cycling is less responsive to drug treatment, uh, I think, 
than other forms of bipolar disorder, and there's very limited data. There's a real uh, need, I think, for specific trials in rapid cycling bipolar disorder. Um, now, NICE says there's no evidence supporting different management from conventional course. I think that we should be thinking about some of the indication, the thyroxine and the nimodipine, uh, that is useful, and of course, taking away antidepressants. There's no formal first choice, consider what's been previously used. There's an idiosyncratic response. Some individuals appear to respond very well to some things. Spontaneous or treatment-related remission is there in about a third of cases. Uh, and of course, rapid cycling comes and goes. Now, NICE talks about non-drug measures. Um, it doesn't really go into this in great detail. I think you want to assure the person's physical health. You want to look at external stressors. You want to uh, also do psychoeducation. Apart from that, I'm not sure there's any specific uh, non-drug measure unless uh, devices or, or VNS is considered. There's one small study, which is a case series of vagal nerve stimulation in rapid cycling uh, bipolar disorder, I think the number of cases is nine, uh, published by Laurie Mango from the United States. That small case series did show some benefits. VNS, the implantation and so on is quite a big deal, but if more uh, less invasive devices such as the oral VNS becomes available, that may be a treatment option. So here's the treatment strategy for rapid cycling. Firstly, think about withdrawing antidepressants. Secondly, evaluate possible precipitants, alcohol, thyroid dysfunction. Thirdly, optimize mood stabilizers. Consider combining mood stabilizers. And then consider adjunct with the various treatments. And I particularly emphasize thyroxin and nimodipine. Uh, and I put some references. The reference 11 is the Laurie Mango VNS study. Uh, I'm quite happy to share my slides with people and I'd be quite happy to uh, take any questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. You, you really have a list of questions uh, for you. Uh, May so I make a comment uh, first? Yeah. Uh, on, on the Cipriani uh, chart you showed, uh, Alan, of uh, efficacy versus uh, acceptability, uh, safety tolerability. Uh, I, I have uh, made the same question again and again to people who do meta-analysis and never, uh, never received uh, a reply. Now, efficacy in terms of uh, last observation carried forward uh, way it's it's a hybrid it's an admixture of efficacy plus acceptability and uh, dropout rate etc uh, and uh, safety tolerability is uh, represented in uh, the placebo arm mainly because of dropouts due to uh, a lack of efficacy while in the treatment arm it is uh, drop out mainly due to adverse event. That, that's, that's not absolute, but it's more or less uh, the usual case. So when you, when you plot efficacy versus tolerability, what you do is you double the weight of tolerability on your model. You double it, at least. Or if, if not exponentially, increase the effect of tolerability. And then you treat drop out because of lack of efficacy, the same way you treat uh, drop out because of adverse event, which is, again, it's, uh, um, it's, it's wrong. But, but they never reply to this question, whether it is justified to do plots like this one and how you could really interpret these plots. Yeah, I think your point is very well made. And uh, it's, it's interesting that you don't reply to you about that. I mean, certainly I think um, the, the measure of acceptability is extremely crude. It's simply staying in the trial. And the measure of efficacy is only a three week measure. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think if you're being very stringent, you do a full intention to treat analysis and then for you might find things which are different. Interestingly, there's, um, there are some of the antipsychotics now appear to be failing 
in many of the trials, particularly the Brexpiprazole has failed in too many of trials, which I suspect may be due to some of the problems that we're seeing in, um, in depression trials where we're having really uh, patients uh, included with inflated symptom scores who are actually quite mildly ill. Uh, but prior to that, I think all of these treatments seem to be effective. But yeah, I think your point about the methodology is very good, Costas. I think Daria might have a few questions to go through, so yes. perhaps we should a do few, that. A few questions, yes. Um, first, uh, uh, wonderful presentation, Professor Allen. And uh, the question is, uh, some ADHD children become bipolar in adult life. Do prescribing stimulants can precipitate mania in these children? Yeah, that's a great point. We're, we've actually got a large grant with uh, Stephen Marwaha in Birmingham to, to, to look at uh, ADHD comorbid with bipolar disorder and indeed comorbid with schizophrenia uh, and to treat with stimulants. Um, I think the rule in all the guidelines is that you should only use stimulants if people are on anti-manic mood stabilizers. So essentially that's lithium valproate or an antipsychotic. Um, I, I think if the diagnosis is clearly ADHD, so it's a longitudinal diagnosis uh, and it pre, pre, predates the bipolar disorder and the person's uh, on an anti-manic mood stabilizer, then I'd be, I think it's clinically reasonable to, to treat with stimulants uh, or similar drugs. I think that's, that's, that's quite fine. Uh, but as I say, we've got this big study starting uh, which will take about five years. So we might have better data after that. Thank you very much, Professor Allen. Also, uh, some questions from Alexei Pavlichenko, who is Associate Professor from Moscow, and he publishes a lot on bipolar disorder as well here in Russia and internationally. And he asks, according to the ICD-10, the first episode of mania is not a bipolar disorder. Should we treat it the same way as we treat bipolar disorder? Yes, that's a great point. And your questioner is obviously very expert in, uh, in bipolar disorder to pick up this point. Um, I think that the, the rate of uh, second episodes in people who've had one episode of mania is, I can't say it's 100%, but it's about 95%. So essentially, I would treat first episode mania with no preceding depression uh, as, as bipolar disorder. And I, I had this discussion with NICE a few years ago because they were going to not include any first episode mania studies uh, into, their, uh, into their analysis. But uh, I think these are very valuable. Now, there may be some first episode manias that, that don't progress to bipolar disorder, but these are really, in my view, quite, quite rare. And remember, if you've had um, mania, but you've had a depression before, then that would satisfy the ICD requirements. Yes, and also Alexei Pavlichenko comments that uh, one mania episode is enough for diagnosis of bipolar disorder in DSM, but not in ICD. So yes. this is the issue, he says. And um, also there is a question uh, from Timur Senikov, associate professor from Moscow. How does the rapid cycling meet uh, with narrow progression views on bipolar disorder? Yeah, I mean, I think the neuro progression, um, well, that's a whole other lecture, but essentially, um, the, if you have more episodes of bipolar disorder, then you have more cognitive impairment. And the, the studies, um, the Dunedin studies, which uh, many of you will know, they, they looked at children in New Zealand and they did simple cognitive tests in the first decade of life. And then they looked in the third decade of life. Now, the children who became schizophrenic were performing more poorly than their peers at the age of seven, for example, on cognitive tests. Uh, and that, that dropped that was present before they became obviously uh, schizophrenic. And the drop-off wasn't huge after becoming ill. The children who became manic were about two-thirds of a standard deviation better 
than the control group. So they, they were on average slightly brighter. And then the fall off came with the episodes. So the episodes uh, of particularly mania are associated with cognitive impairment. And there's been a notion that this is a progressive subtype. Now, I'm quite worried about this for a number of reasons. One is that if you say to patients, they have a prog neuroprogressive disorder, patients think that's like uh, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or Huntington's. Um, there's no doubt that clinically some progress, but we have just published, and I think it came out on PubMed yesterday, a group where we looked at cognitive remediation in 60 patients with bipolar disorder. And we found remarkable improvements with cognitive remediation, showing that people with bipolar disorder have a capacity to, to, to sort of recover their cognitive function, which isn't there in schizophrenia. Uh, this was done with Till, Till Wikes, Dame Till Wikes, using her um, a circuits program, which was developed for schizophrenia and does show benefits in schizophrenia, but they're quite limited. Whereas the benefits in bipolar disorder you can look the paper up in PubMed. It's published in Bipolar Disorders yesterday. Uh, we're really quite considerable. So this doesn't mean that there isn't a neuroprogressive subgroup, but it certainly means that there are bipolars who can actually have a return in cognitive function if they become euthymic, if they don't do other things which are bad for cognition, like alcohol and head injury and so on and so forth, and if they get suitable treatment. So, so I think this is uh, quite interesting news and certainly patients are very interested. And as I say, I'm very concerned about neuroprogression because in my clinic, patients go on the internet and they, they read this and they think they've got something like Parkinson's. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Costas Fontolakis says that we are out of the schedule, so but right, we still have many uh, questions uh, for you. So maybe we will send you. I don't know. We will discuss with Professor Costas. Yeah, just well, you can email them to me and Daria. I sent you my slides, so please share Thank them you. with colleagues. Yes, we will share. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you, Alan, apologies for your... again for getting the time. Uh, yeah, no, no panic attack, but we have phenazepam in Russia. It's okay. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So now. Oleg? Oleg, yes. Oleg to present Carol. Yes, no? yes, I'm here. Uh, dear colleague, <coughs> according to the logical structure of the presentation titles and after discussing different aspects of treatment modalities of the severe mental disorders, it's a good time uh, we move to scope of biology of schizophrenia and I expect to discover this topic of the webinar with the help of Carol Taminga, professor and the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry, University of Texas. Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Uh, Professor Taminga is a world-known expert in understanding the mechanisms underlying schizophrenia, especially its most prominent symptoms, psychosis and memory dysfunction, uh, in order to build rational treatment for this illness. Dr. Taminga is currently a member of uh, National Advisory Board of National Institute of Mental Health and has served on the Board of Scientific Counselors of the National Institute of Mental Health and National Institute of Drug Abuse as council member and president of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology as a member and chair of Psychopharmacological Drug Advisory Committee of the FDA and so on. Today, the topic of her speech will be oriented to understanding the biology of schizophrenia. Please welcome to the stage, Professor Taminga. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here. I think I can do this myself. Uh, if you'll just bear with me a second. Um, oh no. Um, you should uh, share screen, okay. 
but I didn't get my slide now, shared. Uh, open, open, open the PowerPoint. Ah. And now uh, put it in full screen. Not, not this. Uh, the full screen of the PowerPoint. It some, it somehow doesn't down, go on. Down, down. Okay, to to the right, to the right, to the right. Yeah, there. Yes. Slideshow. It does. Oh. Yes. It goes. Okay. Ah. You can tell from my halting start. Thank you very much for whomever was coaching me. Um, this is my first time uh, of being a part of a group like this. Um, I've been um, a part of this the the session since it started this morning, experiencing myself in Moscow, where I've never been, uh, but uh, felt like I was a step closer today. One of the reasons why I really wanted to come here today is because my um, primary uh, partner, my primary collaborator in all this is a Russian lady who was trained in psychiatry in Russia, practiced in Russia, Elena Ivlova, um, and then came to the United States and we have been uh, collaborators ever since. Um, so together we uh, have done a number of studies. I, su uh, I suppose this is a kind of a fitting into a marvelous session like this. This session has really been focused on treatment and very practical things. This is going to be, uh, the, the focus of what I have to say is not going to be probably practical to your everyday practice, but will you give you a glimpse of what we're thinking about in any case. Let me see if I can um, know what to do next. Um, okay. So, as the schizophrenia phenomenology is really what people have been talking about for most of the day is very, very complex. Um, every single person is a combination of all these different uh, phenomenologies. Um, what I'll talk about mainly today is psychosis. But the other, the place where I'm going to start is the phenomenology part of it. And... Um, you know, there was a group of us, and I'll show you all of the group in just a minute, um, decided that in psychiatry, we really needed more than just phenomenology. You know, if you're a psychiatrist, somebody walks into your office, you sit down maybe for 60 minutes, maybe for more and talk to them and find out what they've been experiencing. If you're a neurologist, you sit down with somebody for five or 10 minutes and then send them off for a series of tests. So we wanted to get some tests so that we would know, we, we understood that if we're talking about the dimension of psychosis, that there are some people with bipolar disorder, some people with schizoaffective, some people with schizophrenia, that these kinds of symptom dimensions fall across all of these psychotic disorders. And then there, would, there should be what people think of as intermediate phenotypes. And these intermediate phenotypes should be measurable entities. They could be brain volume, they could be EEG, they could be eye tracking. And these intermediate phenotypes are measurable. And at least it was reasonable at the beginning to think that there might be a couple of these measurements that would fall on schizophrenia, a couple of them that might fall on schizoaffective disorder, and a couple of them that would fall on bipolar disorder. Then there was a point in, 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 the, in the genetics of psychotic disorders or schizophrenia when people thought that genes were attached to these intermediate phenotypes and that the, uh, the, the, uh, ge the genetics of something like abnormal eye tracking or a volume loss in schizophrenia, the genetics of that would be clearer than the genetics of the illness. Now, one of the reasons I show this um, picture, this uh, model, is that uh, ju just to tell you about where we started, but in fact, there's very little in this model that turned out to be true. Um, and so that there's a, what we decided to call ourselves as the bipolar, bipolar Schizophrenia Network for Intermediate Phenotypes, and we call ourselves BSNP for short. We're located at, um, um, we're located at centers around the United States, Yale, Harvard, University of Chicago, University of Georgia. And here's me in Texas. I know that's a long ways away from where all, all, all of you are, um, but I'm just sort of just pleased to be here. Um, we've done three different studies. There's BSNP1 and BSNP2, and we had fairly high um, um, numbers in each study between two and 3,000, um, just in order to get enough cases so that we could do data analysis, the kind of data analysis I'll show you in a minute. 
We did one study in between called the PARGIP study, and this is a study where we compared psychotic and non-psychotic bipolar disorder, just like Alan was just talking about. Um, and what, but we didn't, we didn't look at treatment and we didn't look at really clinical phenomenology. We just looked at the, um, the uh, biology of these. Now, let me show you what we really looked at. We, we thought of ourselves as doing psychosis phenotyping and we used a B-SNP battery. And essentially we measured everything that we could. Um, we did a, a, a lot of clinical characteristics where we did a lot of demographics. We did the skid as a, as in order to make the, di the diagnoses. We did a number of symptom scales, as you can see, the PANS, the YMRS, the MADRAS. We did the Birchwood scale for a social function scale. Um, we did the childhood trauma questionnaire. And, and then we did probably two weeks worth of neurobiologic characteristics. Um, we looked at different aspects of cognition. For cognition, we used the BACs as our, as, as our basic um, um, as our basic cognition, and then we did a number of other um, electronic uh, aspects of cognition. We did neurophysiology, resting state EEG, we did evoke potential, we did steady state auditory, steady state visual. We tried to be as comprehensive as we could. This is more than you could just do in a doctor's office, but what we were trying to do is really measure as much as we could in order to decide what was useful to measure. We wanted to really pick our, um, pick our um, biomarkers after we took a careful look at everything. We look at imaging, and for the main part of imaging, we looked at structure, but we also looked at resting state, fMRI, DTI, and arterial spin labeling. Oops, oops. And then we, uh, we took a blood sample, and for the blood samples, we mainly did genetics, um, or we mainly, I should say, in the process of doing genetics, and we kept serum and plasma. So this is, this is a picture of my um, uh, colleague, uh, my Russian colleague, her name is Dr. Ivleva, and uh, this, it, it's just only, uh, it's only an excuse to show you uh, what she looked like, and uh, she gives her best to everybody. I'm sure she has some uh, friends in the audience. So after we got done measuring everybody, these are the results of several of these studies in the BSNP-1, uh, where we had a thousand probands, we had a thousand of their family members and 500 uh, normal controls. And what you'll see first, if you just look at this, uh, it, it just this um, uh, figure right on top in the middle, um, these are people who had more bipolar-like illness. These are people who had more schizophrenic illness. These are people who had schizoaffective illness. And you can see that these diagnostic groups run together. Um, and that, any, that when we looked at these diagnostic groups, the people with schizophrenia, this is a back scale, so this is me a measurement of cognition. The people with schizophrenia always did the worst. The people with bipolar disorder always, almost always did the best. Um, and, um, but there was nothing that, other than the, the magnitude of their symptoms, there was nothing distinctive about these. Um, there was nothing by way of um, biomarker that was distinctive. So I'll just remind you, we had set out to find one or two biomarkers for schizophrenia, one or two biomarkers for bipolar, perhaps a biomarker or two that would separate psychotic and non-psychotic bipolar disorder. So we would know where the edge of psychosis was. And in fact, we found nothing like that. I'll show you just, um, no, I won't show you that on this picture. I'll have to wait for another picture. So we were very uh, despondent because it really meant that the diagnoses that we work with, um, that there was no evidence that the diagnoses we work with have a biological basis. And of course, the reason we were looking at for a biological basis is to find a target, a druggable target in each of the biomarkers that would then allow us in a more rational way than we do now to target a biomarker and to move ahead. Well, we didn't find any, uh, we, looked at, we looked at all the biomarkers in uh, the, the different diagnoses we found with respect to biomarkers. Now this is not phenomenology, but with respect to biomarkers, we found no differences. So we were eager to move to the next step and we didn't understand what that step was. So just as a, as a, 
as a way to move forward, we pooled everybody and we pooled them into a common class called psychosis. And then we um, applied our prism, if you will, of cognitive control and sensory motor reactivity. These are all of the different kinds of biomarkers, um, mostly cognitive and electrophysiologic and eye tracking. And we uh, did a, a, a various kind of statistical computational approaches. And what we were wondering was if we look at just the biomarkers and don't pay any attention to diagnoses, um, are there groups, more homogeneous groups that fall out? And we were really quite surprised to see that the answer to that study was yes, that we could take a group of a thousand people with psychosis and we could divide them into different groups. And we happened to call these groups biotypes. And inventively, we called them biotype one, biotype two, and biotype three. Now, um, these groups were very different from each other biologically. They were all psychotic and their level of psychosis was not significantly different from each other. Uh, this group, however, had very, very low cognition. This group had low EEG. This is resting state EEG. This is evoked potential, and this is very, very low. They would, <laughs> they were very, they had very low EEG. Um, their cognition was the lowest. The biotype two, had slightly better cognition, although not remarkably so, and still significantly. But instead of very, very low EEG, they had very high EEG. They had very high resting state. They had very high evoked potential. Just, just to compare it with, you can look at biotype three. Biotype three had rather normal resting state and evoked potential EEG. Um, so you can see that Biotype 1 and Biotype 2 had opposite EEG characteristics, fairly similar cognitive characteristics. And then Biotype 3 um, was in some ways the most puzzling because they were as psychotic as everybody else, but they had almost normal EEG, almost normal cognition, a little bit low cognition. They had um, a normal uh, eye tracking, and we couldn't figure out why in the world they might be psychotic. Finally, one of the guys said, oh, I bet those are the potheads. So in one of the five sites, we had actually measured cannabis use. And this was the group that had, compared to biotype one and two, it had the highest rate of cannabis use. Um, so we kind of had thought of biotype three as something you might call exogenous psychosis. So for environmental reasons, uh, they might be psychotic. Let me go on and show you a few more things. Um, with respect to diagnosis, the orange dots here are uh, people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. The purple dots are people with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And these two colors are schizoaffective disorders. So we had about the same level of schizophrenia percentage, about 33% of schizophrenia in each of the biotype groups. Whoops. This is biotype one, this is biotype two, and this is biotype three. Biotype 3 clearly had a predominance of and significantly so bipolar disorder, but there were still quite a number of bipolar disorders in biotype 1. Um, in biotype 1, biotype 1 had the highest number of relatives with uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorder. Um, and then when we did the, the polygene risk score, this was an early risk genes polygene score that we did. Uh, we found a significantly higher level in biotype one. Something's wrong with my computer, sorry. In, but, so it's clear that biotype one has probably a preponderance of um, a, a genetic uh, load. Um, when we were wondering then, therefore, what could we do with these kinds of data, we decided we wanted to ask the question, where are psychotic symptoms located in the brain? So we took all of the people that I've showed you data from, and we took people with the highest psychotic symptoms, and we wanted to find out where, what the cortical thickness was. We wanted to find out some marker in the brain for high psychotic symptoms, and we used the multidimensional item response theory, um, a, 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 a computational approach that's dependent on high numbers. And we asked, um, which were, the which were the elements in the PANS, in the um, uh, YMRS, and in the um, MADRAS 
um, psychotic items. The not, no psychotic items came out of the madras, but in terms of the pans and the uh, mania rating scale, these are the these are the psychosis items that these, this multidimensional response theory drew out. Now we we took all of these response theories and we said where where, where do high levels of these symptoms correlate with low cortical thickness? And what we found was fairly interesting in that. There was a coal. There was a coal. There, there was a single large um, um, re region of brain that went all the way from the frontal cortex, covered the temporal cortex, included a bit of the parietal cortex, back to the back of the brain. Um, both on the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain, on the medial side of the brain, and especially in inferior levels. So this was surprising because. It, um, it, what we had thought might happen was that we would just have a salt and pepper view of the whole brain, which would say that psychosis involved areas are really scattered throughout the brain. But what this suggests is that areas that are, um, that have the lowest cortical thickness, and this is a, um, this is a measure of pathology in some, to some degree, um, th those areas of cortical thickness really overlie the whole temporal cortex and extend um, up to the frontal and back to the occipital cortex. One of the, th uh, so it, it was easy, easiest for us to look initially at where we were going to, um, um, at, 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 at what we could say about psychosis using these biological features. One of the things that I wanted to be sure to say, um, because uh, Costas already started discussing the cortical volume issue, is that biotype one, two, and three, I'm just going to go back to this slide. Biotype one, two, and three had different levels of uh, cortical volume loss. Biotype one had the most, but but it wasn't just in magnitude; it was in distribution. Um, biotype one had the most uh, volume loss, and that volume loss was all throughout the whole neocortical mantle. Biotype two had uh, about a medium amount of volume loss in cortex, and it was almost entirely focused on the frontal parietal, um, the frontal temporal, excuse me, the frontal temporal area. Um, biotype three had a good deal of um, cortical uh, volume loss, but it was entirely focused on the limbic system. So even just that uh, would suggest, was, was sort of interesting for our anatomy. Um, the, 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 the regions in this temporal cortex, of course, are right over the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is, I want to switch uh, topics just a little bit and tell you about some of the uh, pathology that we find in hippocampus. It had always seemed to me that um, if the brain was going to make a hallucination or if the brain was going to make a delusion, um, it really needed, you needed some abnormality in the hippocampus in order to do it because the hippocampus is where we make memories. And there's much um, of there's much of a of hallucinations and delusions that uh, uh, resemble a memory. So this is a human postmortem hippocampus. Uh, a, you have uh, a hippocampus on the right and a hippocampus on the left, and the actual size of that is about the size of your little finger. So it's not an area that's very big in the human brain because the human cortex has ballooned so much. But all throughout um, the animal kingdom, the hippocampus is very important, has the same role, and has a differentially size um, effect in other species. Now, in most, in schizophrenia, in most parts of the brain, if you look at where there's hypoactivity and hyperactivity, most of the brain in schizophrenia shows a reduction in activity. This happens to be a reduction in resting state um, fMRI. Uh, there's, there's, there's two places, however, where you see hyperactivity in hippocampus. And this just happens, and, and one is the left, um, the left um, uh, hippocampal formation, and the other one is the right hippocampal formation. So this is one study of probably three or four or five different studies from different laboratories showing hippocampal hyperactivity in uh, schizophrenia. And this is just the area that we were looking at. The, um, the hippocampus is very well known because as you know, um, um, this was originally the area, this is an area that's very important in seizure disorders. And um, back in the 1950s, um, when just when neurosurgeons understood that the hippocampus was important in seizure disorders and that if you found 
the seizure disorder and cut out the tissue, the seizures would go away. So um, they, uh, they did it about 1952 HM. All of us know him as HM. We now know him as Henry Meliason. They took out his left and his right hippocampus and he lost all ability to make new memories. His, um, his uh, seizure disorder was cured, but he couldn't make new memory. People have intensively studied the hippocampus and we know a lot about it. We know a lot about the anatomy. The enteronocortex functions as a funnel, takes all stimuli from the neocortex and funnels that stimuli in a one-way pathway through the dentate gyrus, through CA3, through CA1, out the subiculum, and, and through this pathway puts together a memory. So you could imagine, none of it, and all of this happens unconsciously. When we walk into a new room and see what the room looks like, the, the, the stimuli from that um, flow through the dentate gyrus, through CA3, through CA1, and each one of these areas does a different uh, task to do with memory, and then um, um, pushes that memory out the other side. Um, we never, if there were some mistakes in this pathway, we would never know it. This is a whole unconscious pathway. So if we associate things that shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be associated together, instead of a true memory coming out the other side, there may be a mistaken memory and that memory could potentially be a hallucination, potentially be a delusion. This is totally speculative, but this is the, the um, basis of our, um, of our, of our, of what we've done. Now, when we took a look at the hippocampus, previously people had taken a look at the whole hippocampus all together. Our approach to this was, uh, was an approach where we wanted to take each one of these uh, regions independently, just to, because we understood in terms of memory function, these are all very, very different. So we took the dentate gyrus out, we took CA3 out, we took CA1 out. Um, and what we found was really very interesting. When we looked at the dentate gyrus, now remember the whole hippocampus, this whole red circle, if you image it with an MR scanner, will be hyperactive. So the first one, the first area we looked at was the dentate gyrus and we measured gluin one which is essentially measuring the NMDA receptor. And what we found was that people with schizophrenia in the dentate gyrus had a reduced number of NMDA receptors. Well, this was very puzzling to us because what we were looking for was some explanation for hyperactivity, not hypoactivity, hyperactivity. This, would, this is a measure that would be consistent with hypoactivity. But then in a very interesting way, we went to CA3 and we found out that this hypoactivity in dentate gyrus turned into hyperactivity in CA3. We found an increase in this gluin2b um, receptor in CA3. This is the most excitatory of the NMDA receptors. We found an increase in BDNF, which is routinely used in chart in, um, to uh, look at uh, a regional hyperactivity in schizophrenia. We found increases in BDNF. We found increases in PSD95, which is a protein that's on the postsynaptic receptor. And because we found out this, we decided to take human tissue and look at Golgi. And I'm gonna show you on the next slide what that really looks like. This is a human hippocampus. And what you see is what the Golgi neurons look like in the, in, in the human brain. It's, I just think that these neurons are so beautiful. They have the pyramidal cell body structure here. They have the apical dendrites, and these are the parts of the, um, the dendrites on the, these are uh, glutamatergic neurons. They contain glutamate as their neurotransmitter. And, and all of, throughout this whole area, afferents impinge on this. Well, if you look at what these, if you take um, this afferent from, nor, from a normal brain, you can see what they look like. These, all these little blebs that you see are little, um, pockets, a little, little um, expansions of um, synapses. So these really give you an idea that, this, that in, even in normal people, this is a synapse-rich part of the hippocampus. If you look at schizophrenics, instead of seeing a reduction, you see a tremendous increase. Here you see an increase in these blebs, which, would, which really um, is the anatomic fingerprint for hyperactivity. Um, if you look at these other neurons, at these other dendrites down on the bottom, as they get ready to leave the neuron, um, the, the uh, normal 
um, neuron and, and the schizophrenic neuron look just indistinguishable. So it's only in this area in the apical dendrites where you see hyperactivity. Uh, then we made another mo uh, on, we made another model. Excuse me. We made another model where we hypothesized that a, really a molecular lesion occurs in the dentate gyrus. There's a reduction in activity in this uh, pathway, and there's a hyperactivity, a, 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 a paradoxical hyperactivity in CA3, hyperactivity in CA1. And that hyperactivity um, contributes to, doesn't, isn't the only thing involved in, but contributes to psycho psychosis. This is our hypothesis. So we had an, and we got an animal model where we made molecular lesions. There's one animal model which, which we have as a knockout and another one uh, where we really knock out the dentate gyrus. In both of those models, we can confirm this kind of a, uh, oops, excuse me, where we can confirm uh, this kind of reduction in activity, and we can confirm hyperactivity in CA3. We've done that in an animal model already. Um, but even before that, we did, um, we looked at a, a transcriptome analysis, and th these just show you data, um, you know, and you don't have to really look at that, except this is another way of um, an analyzing CA3 and we found that CA3 was enriched in excitatory neuronal genes. So this, the, these analyses all suggest uh, that CA3 um, contains an enrichment of excitatory genes. What's curious is in that what, what we found in CA1, which is downstream from CA3, um, is we've actually found a decrease in gene transcripts for excitatory neurons, but an increase in transcripts for inhibitory neurons, which, which to us meant that that CA3 was really trying to compensate to some degree. If you look at CA3 three and CA1 um, in, a, in, a, in vivo, in a live person with schizophrenia, um, you find both CA3 and CA1, but CA1 uh, significantly um, elevated. So I just want to, I already told you about this mouse model. Um, and in the mouse model, where we knock out gluin one, in the dentate gyrus, just an exact translation of what we actually saw in um, in the in the mouse. We found it. We we can see an increase in the AMPA receptor function. We see an increase in the knockout in the NMDA receptor function, not by a little bit, but by a lot, suggesting that if we um, knock out the uh, if we if we disturb the dentate gyrus and do it. Um, a, do it during development, actually, that's another thing. Do it during development, we see a very, uh, an increase in CA3 act activity, which then goes downhill. And this shows you actually, when we look at CFOS activity, um, one marker of hyperactive tissue is, uh, is uh, CFOS expression. And you can see from this graph that in this mouse knockout, we have a very large uh, increase in, C in CFOS in CA3. We have a significant increase of CFOS in CA1. And, and if you look at this, I won't, I won't really explain it all to you, but this is the anterior part of the hippocampus. So it's not in the, this effect is not in the posterior hippocampus. It's really confined, it's, it's really confined to the an anterior hippocampus. Now, what are we gonna, what have we found in this mouse that's really pertinent to translate back to the human? Well, I already told you, um, we've discovered really a downstream circuit, which was very, very interesting. We, we started with the mouse, and the only thing that's wrong in this mouse is that the dentate gyrus is reduced. And then what I just showed you is that CA3, CA1 shows hyperactivity. Then in the mouse brain, when we look for other regions of the mouse brain, that should have been normal because it's a normal mouse except for just a little dentate gyrus activity. We saw increases in the amygdala. We saw increases in the medial part of the prefrontal cortex near the anterior cingulate. And we saw increases in the nucleus accumbens. Now this, these data from, um, uh, from the mouse would suggest to us that it's not only just the hyperactivity in the hippocampus, but it's this uh, circuit um, this hyperactivity circuit that gets set up in addition to that. The other thing that we saw in this mouse that was very, very interesting is the identification of a risk window. 
um, when we went into the uh, dentate gyrus with a dread and we decreased the uh, function of the dentate gyrus, which showed which in six week six week old mice and ten week old mice, the six week old six week old mice we would call an adolescent mouse and the 10 week old mouse we would call an adult mouse. We find the dentate gyrus looks the same, but then when we look at CA3 in the adolescent mouse versus the adult mouse, we find the hyperactivity in the adolescent mouse, just like the whole story I've already told you, but that that hyperactivity, um, it, it, it does not happen in the adult mouse brain, suggesting that there is a risk window for this phenomenon that I've described to you which for clinicians, you know, it's, uh, this, is, this is when we see um, the onset uh, for the most part of, of schizophrenia and of a lot of the other psychotic illnesses. So, you know, between, this is a, this is a set, this is a, uh, a, 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 on the left in 1750, um, a, a wood uh, engraving of Maudsley Hospital um, and, you can see what an insanity looked like in 1750. Then in um, 1996, uh, the National Geographic in the United States um, ran a story about schizophrenia and they put schizophrenia as a disease of the brain. It was one of the first times that schizophrenia was really published in a non-scientific journal as a disease of the brain. Um, really, the difference between 19, 1750 and 1996 in terms of the experience of having psychosis was very little different. And what I would like to do, uh, what I would like to contribute is to a biologic understanding of the psychotic diseases that we're talking about today. So that when it comes to looking at 2030, we can get a little bit different uh, contrast than what you see here. So these are all the people that I've worked with. My, um, my major collaborator in all the clinical studies has been Dr. Ivlova. <clears throat> and um, you can see a, a, a number of the names, including all the rest of the PIs in the BSNP study. So with this, I'll end and say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. It's an amazing presentation and uh, my supervisor, Professor Asan Jablenski from University of Western Australia, he is really a fan of your research and he always mentions Professor Brett Clements, who is in your team of collaboration. He always uh, cited your research and I remember this slide with biotypes, it's something exceptional. So this uh, talk is uh, very impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Yablonsky has been an inspiration for us, I have to say, and he's really uh, one of the people that tends to think about psychosis in this kind of way. So we've exchanged a lot of ideas over the years. Thank you for mentioning him. Thank, thank you. Thank you for everything. So we have Just uh, um, Associate Professor Timur Sinikov uh, has one question about does bipolars among those groups differ on neurocognitive and other tests in mania versus depression? And if this is the case, how did you manage this in your study? This is the question. Yeah, let me just show you the picture again. Um, uh, but first, I should say that these are all stable outpatients. So these, uh, none, none of the people that we looked at are in, um, I mean, they're, they're in active phases of their illness, but they're not, they're in steady phases of their illness. Um, this is the uh, co co cognition uh, slide. And, um, and there's nobody really with a depression here. Uh, the people with bipolar disorders are closest to normals, and the people with schizophrenia are farthest away from normals. I don't think we could. Um, uh, th this date, this data set isn't um, um, doesn't cross episodes enough for us to ask that kind of a question and get a good answer. Okay. 
impressive uh, graphs <laughs> really what can i say thank you thank you for your answer and this is i think uh one more answer from arsen uh um, question i'm sorry uh, from arsen artsuni does the biology of this schizotypal personality disorder according to dsm differ significantly um, we did do, in all of the family members, we did do the schizophrenia spectrum, uh, the uh, SIDP. So we have a good idea of family members who have spectrum disorders. And the kind of pathology that the, fa that the schizotypal people had, um, both with respect to cognition, um, EEG, and volume, um, w w a paralleled the... Um, it pa parallel psychosis, parallel schizophrenia, except was milder. So it really looked, from the biologic point of view, it really looked like schizotypal disorder was just a, a, a milder form of the, psych of the full form psychotic disorder. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we are a bit out of uh, time schedule. Yes, Costas. Well, uh, I will give the, uh, the podium, let's say the virtual podium to Peter and Oleg and Afzal for closing this uh, uh, very interesting and very important. I think uh, it was the, the first major, right, Afzal? Yeah. The first major endeavor of this kind. Of course, of course. And uh, actually, I must say that all credit goes to you because you have been behind all these activities and you have no, been no, no, Daria, no, Daria, no, 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 Daria did the work. No, no, you, no, no. I, <laughs> Daria I know, I know, I know, but, but, but this was no, a no, no, great okay. idea. This was a great idea that we were trying to pursue from the platform of WPA. And the best thing is that with this activity, we have been able to involve the Russian society. We have been able to involve the Zone 10. We have been involved be able to involve the sections and such a brilliant and exceptional list of speakers. I wish these speakers actually need one full day for each one. I mean, they are, they are, so, they are, so, they are so impressive and uh, the information is clinical, information is academic and information is more educational for all of us. So I must thank all the speakers. I must thank all the organizers. And uh, Costas, uh, Peter, and Oleg, and Daria, we have got now more work for you. So I will look forward <laughs> listening to you and receiving your you. next message for the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was delighted to be invited. Thanks, Costas. Thank you. See you Thank soon. You. Take care. Thank care. you. Thank you very much.